All right, you guys. We're back. Damn. Um, yeah, it's on Maple and Willow. You're going to do it on that one? Mm-hmm. Why? Let's share this one. Hmm? What's up, Kenji? Beautiful thing. Nice to show up. Have a blown-out garage light. See that right here, you know? Beautiful king I've seen. All right. We're live. Eddie Gracie Day. What's up, you guys? He don't have a seat right here. Let's move move this forward. Yeah, I can bring this a little closer, but it's going to make it a little bit of this. This can go a little further. It's going to roll all the way out, you know? A little bit more, yeah. So you guys click that share button, let's get the word out. Um, we're gonna hope that this internet connection holds up, but in the meantime, we wanna give a special shout out of the century, um, of the century plus four years to our grandfather, Grandmaster Eddie Gracie. Um, today is his birthday, and we've been waiting for an excuse to do a free live seminar for the world, right? Ever since the technology has kind of caught up to, to the point that it's at right now, we knew the day would come that we would do something like this where we could just share jujitsu and connect with you guys all over the world ideas, lots of ideas. And the only challenge about this format is that we can't see them doing the techniques. That would be the only step better than this. You guys could see us and then we all have live webcams in your houses. And then when you raise your hand, we get to click on your camera and then we get to watch your house. And then while we're watching you demonstrate on your living room rug right there, we can see your technique assess. And then uh, the next person gets to raise their hand in the digital uh, training room. You feel me? That technology exists. Now imagine if it's our out there. It, it is out yeah. there, but the question, is it? We'll do it one day, yes. Um, but our grandfather, in terms of kind of where Jiu-Jitsu has arrived to today, we have a lot of questions to get to. A lot of questions were asked before this party began uh, in, the, in the days prior. And uh, I just think it would be so amazing if our grandfather had the opportunity to see that Jiu-Jitsu was now um, shareable in such a broad format to so many people around the world, thanks to things like Facebook and you know smartphones and this technology. At the, uh, at, the, at the later years of his life, he kind of knew about the internet, he was very well aware of what was going on and the fact that information could be shared so easily, but the streaming, live streaming technology did not exist, so I think he would've been blown away yeah, by this. Yeah, he'd been very happy to see, and he was all about sharing jujitsu. So if we say, Grandpa, you can reach a couple thousand people by pushing this button, he's gonna get excited. That's what's up. Yes. So we wanted to have a chance to get with you guys, and um, we have our, our our loyal and super homie friends here helping us out. Uh, in case we need backup, we have Evandro. We'll turn this over here. Just give him a quick peek. There's up, Evandro guys? right there, and there's Jay, our data database manager, uh, Jay Wong. <laughs> and Jada is like a living jujitsu encyclopedia. Um, like every video that has ever been published ever, every video that's ever been published ever that uh, Oops. that includes anything jujitsu-wise um, pertinent to the situation, Jay knows that it exists. And uh, I don't know, man. He uh, it's like he it's like he has a job, a full-time job, eight hours a day, dealing with this data of uh, jujitsu around the world. And um, so, anyways, <laughs> those who know Jay know I just blasted him a little bit. Hopefully, his boss is not watching this. Um, his but wife, <laughs> his wife can watch because he's doing it not at home. He's doing it at work. Oh, it's actually at home too on midnight. Sometimes you see a post at a crazy time. But Jay is here helping us filter the questions um, to get to the best of them. And here's our idea, you guys. We want the best question. We want the deep questions. We want the the ones, the deep ones, the deep ones, you guys. But here's the, the other thing is we want the ones that will affect and help the most people because naturally we're speaking to a larger audience. We don't want to, you know, make it to where only one person is benefiting from an answer. But um, Jay, why don't you get us started with one of these concept mindset questions then we'll get into a technique after that and we're going to bounce between concept, lifestyle, philosophy and um, technique questions. Uh, um, all right. So Casey uh, asks, uh, how do you embrace the journey? as you work towards uh, the next strike or a higher belt and continue to stay motivated through the process? Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day. The question is regarding belts and promotions and how do you stay motivated? So many belts, and Jiu-Jitsu is one of the longest journeys in martial arts, right, in terms of belt progression. How does someone stay excited, especially once they get their blue belt and they're working towards purple belt? It's a good three to four years at least on that journey. How do you stay excited during that process? How do you recommend someone when they feel like they're not getting better? And this is the blue belt blues, they call it. They feel like it's over. It's like, man, I... I'm not growing every single day. How do I stay with this? You're asking me. I'm asking you to tell so them. We, we always talk about having, you know, I guess setting small goals, right? Oftentimes you allow your next stripe or your next belt to be what determines 
you know, how, how much you're growing and where you are, but don't, don't think about the belt too much. Think more about the small victories that exist in a role that happens every day. For example, if, if I side Mount Henner and I'm able to control him for 20, 30 seconds longer than I did the day before, or 10 seconds longer, that's a victory in itself. He might even submit me at the end of a 10 minute round, but I, I take the small victories. And that's something that takes a lot of practice and it happens, it's more important the further down the journey, right? When you're like three, four, five, six years in, you need something other than what? The high that exists when you learn a new move. Right. Because in the beginning, you're so excited. Everything, Everything is new, so you're like, I'm just gonna keep going every day. When that new, when the novelty wears off, the question is where do you find these small victories to make it to where it's still exciting for you? And two things I wanted to say about that. One is regarding a blue belt that I rolled with two days ago uh, at our academy, Alejandro, first stripe blue belt. And the second is, whether or not they would continue to train if belts did not exist in jiu-jitsu. What do you think? I think most people, they need something. They, they need would something. not continue. It's hard to identify mm -hmm. your own progress. Most right? people would not, and they would have a hard time admitting it. Well, here's another question then. You didn't start because of belt progression. That's not why you started jiu-jitsu. You came into the building not thinking of a blue belt. You came into the yes. building thinking of what? Self-defense, survival, you know, get better shape, camaraderie, connection. So since you didn't start because of the belt, don't quit because of the belt. That's well, the number one. It's difficult because the culture gives so much attention it's true, to the it's belt. It's true, it's true. Everybody in the room respects the higher belts and, you know, you guys, they move let's, better. Let's use this opportunity to segue into the first technical question, okay, which is the one I wanted to talk about regarding Alejandro, a blue belt who I rolled with and I'm like, oh, he's kind of a newer blue belt, one stripe, he just earned that stripe that day, so it was like a congratulatory roll. And I was rolling with Alejandro and I was like, all right, this is gonna be you know, the typical me moving and it's gonna be super easy for me to do whatever I want, whenever I want. He's gonna make so many mistakes, I hope, that I'll just take advantage of his mistakes and it'll be like, you know, just free acai bowls for everyone, right? That's what I thought. And then we're rolling and he ends up in my guard, you guys. Get it, get down here, let's make sure they can see us. Just angle this down just a little no, bit. It has a little... Let me see if I can just right? do this, yeah. Just go wider, yeah. Right here. What's up, guys? Who's there? Howard Steele, Audible. What's up, yo's? So we're here. It looks pretty good. So let's rotate head to them a little more. Come in this way. So the question becomes, we've been on the guard chapter right now in the, uh, at the academy. Guard passing chapter is the focus of the situation right now. So I was rolling with Alejandro, and he landed in my guard, and I expected him to do what everyone else, from white to black belt, whether they're training at the academy or whether they're visiting from all over the world does, which is what? Land in the guard, and then right when they land on the guard, what do they try to do? Sit up, make a good posture, try to break the guard, and try to pop these legs open. My question to you guys, the viewing audience, is what's the best way to break Hidon's guard? Somebody give me some advice. Come on, you guys, right now. Jay's in the comments. He's scanning you guys right now. The best way, someone give me the best way to break Hidon's guard. Now, Ivandra's over here laughing on this side, like kind of busting up quietly because he's tried to break Hidon's guard. And I want some, are there any answers that are coming in? Are they listening or are these people like kind of a little bit? Uh, Doug says chill. Chill, so don't do anything. Good idea, that's what Alejandro did. But the problem is everyone for some reason has this mindset that if you're in the guard, you need to break the guard. You need to break their legs open. And when someone comes in Hidon's guard or in my guard and they make up their mind that they have to break the guard, that's exactly what we want them to do. Right? So just as a simple example, I'm gonna try to break a guard. Do, I'm gonna do the knee in the center. You do what you normally do to everybody in the world. Watch. And you get swept. Oh man, your broke guard, you swept yourself. Go back. Why? Because as I look to make my posture here and try to adjust my knee, for a moment I'm off balance, and at that very moment he don't tip me in that direction. And then what happened? My very desire to break his guard is what got me triangled. Or let's say instead you're like, no, I wanna use the elbow, right? You're a big guy, 220 pounder, and you're gonna use your elbow to kind of grind it. Then you get triangled as a result of your elbow grinding in his thigh. So the question is, if you're inside someone's guard and you make up your mind that you have to break it, let's say you say, in 30 seconds I have to, yes, double pan control. I'm gonna go break the guard. Did this happen? When I was 17, I did a competition when I was 17, purple belt. The guy went hard down here, shot both hands in and got choked. And got cross choked. All of this is a result of them trying to break the guard on the top. And that's the problem, you guys. If you're on top of the guard and you decide that you have to break their guard, you're gonna get submitted for them. You're gonna get swept for them because you're gonna create the opportunity. So what Alejandro did was this, get here. This is what he did. Let's back up a little so they have a better angle for us. Let's yes, back up a little. So how's that better? What Alejandro did was this. He landed and he went like this, boom. Go for a cross stroke, you know, for real. Go for a sweep, your little tip sweep.
Bring it in, bring it in, bring it in, bring it in. Now freeze, then he opened up the door and he got out. No, he didn't. Yes, you guys. So this is a blue belt who very intelligently reversed the role of responsibility. And I learned this from Hidon, the importance of this, but somehow it landed. And I don't know if you watched some of your videos or he did a seminar or a class with Hidon, but he was the most intelligent guard, patience, waiter. Meaning he was waiting in the guard and he did nothing. And then what happened when I, could, when I couldn't submit him from that small bicep blocking head down position, a very wide knees, low hips, arms on the inside. When I couldn't submit him, what do you think I tried to do? Open my guard to go for what I could go for. And when I did, he backed out. I broke my own guard for him because he put the responsibility on me to submit him, not on himself to break it. You guys, and, and this is something that I learned from jujitsu, right? This is jujitsu. When you land in a... Uh, defensive and inferior right. position. Right. It's it's irresponsible to think about moving forward if you can't just simply defend yourself. Can't prevent what they want from right. that. You can't defend is, yourself yeah. for a minute or two minutes. We love passing the guard. I do want to pass Henner's guard and side mount and mount him, but I can't start to begin a guard pass if I'm uncomfortable inside your if legs. you can't survive my guard. Once yeah. I find a certain level of comfort, then I can begin to think about how I might pass the guard. Well, and nobody does that. Bottom of the mount. Every position. They land on the bottom of the mount and they're like, I gotta get out right now. And they get choked right there. Instead of saying, wait a minute, I'm bottom of the mount, I gotta prevent their attack first. And if I defend myself successfully, they will frustratedly continue to yeah. attack and give me the opening that I need. You can't go on vacation to the Bahamas or to Hawaii if you don't have your home life situated. If you can't barely pay your mortgage or your rent, you shouldn't go on vacation. You guys, pay the bills, pay the bills. Listen, but here's the bottom line of all this. The question they're wondering right now is why is, so the responsibility in the guard, top person in the guard, bottom person in the guard, is it the bottom person's responsibility to submit the top person or the top person's responsibility to pass the bottom person's guard? It's, it's no one's. Hold on, that's a good question, bro. It's no one's to do anything unless it's two brothers two friends training jujitsu. Right. But then it's the person, someone lands, the so offensive person has to attack. But in the street fight, it's nobody's. It's you understand? Nobody's. If I'm inside someone's guard, you don't have to attack me, I don't have to pass. And the problem is, if you're, here's where these, these, uh, these artificial constraints and impositions happen. When you're training for a competition where it's a five minute round or a six minute round and you're down by two points and you're inside someone's guard, guess what? It's your responsibility to break the guard. The problem is when you're rolling with me and there's no time limit or there's no points tally going on and you make up your mind that you have to break my guard, you're going to get choked because of it. So all we're saying is be aware of the things that create or cause you to behave the way you do in each position. And if these artificial impositions and constraints that exist based on competition or training for specifically that engagement, think of that, how that affects you in a real fight situation or in a real life situation or rolling with this guy, how it might change your role. Anyways, rolling some things anybody. to think about. The bottom line is this, Jiu Jitsu is the art of deferring. If I have you in my guard, I want you to try to break my guard and in trying, I'm gonna take advantage of your mistake. Yeah, because you can't try to break the guard and have amazing defense at the same time. Yes, and ironically, if I'm in your guard, I want you to try to submit me Yes. and then take advantage of the opening you create. So the answer is the onus of movement is always on the other person if you're mastering Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Whoever goes first loses. Yes, that's the moral of the story. Too much on this topic. Next question, next topic. What do we got here, Jay? On technique. Um, yes. Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's do uh, from Lockmail, uh, standing self-defense modification for women's bear hug from behind. The arms are pinned and the arms are up. Uh, and it's, and so bear hug over the arms from behind and how, how you can't pick the guy up. You can't pick the guy up. What's up? Miguel, I, Anaya is here for tuning in. Good to see everybody. Guys, hit that share button. You know, stand up. And so about, these, about these self-defense techniques, you know, hopefully all of you out there are already exploring these and practicing these. These are very important. Eddie Gracie will be very happy to know you're all doing this. So these uh, standing self-defense techniques, rear bear hug over the arms was the question. What if you, so he don't agree, reaches up behind me, grabs me. The technique, the normal technique, as they grab you, is to drop into base, is to step around, is to bring it in, and then to be able to come over here and attack. And the question that we got was, uh, how do you do this technique if you can't pick the person up? And there's no doubt that there are times where, oh, well, there's no doubt that with proper leverage, the way our grandfather taught it and the way it was so expertly executed, you can pretty much teach someone much smaller to pick up someone much bigger. 
but there are max capacities, we should say, right? There are certain limits yes. to reasonableness. So this modification that we use in the rear bear hug, grab me again here. If the person is too big to throw, as they grab you, base, step around, and you already fall, boom, into a rear takedown. Now I keep the legs right here trying to throw me. Can't throw me, and then I shoot my leg out, and I'm good to go. Do the back side. Okay. So hopefully you guys got that one. Rear bear hug over the arms. Do the so back angle. With the leg. Yes, yeah, so watch my leg. So I drop into base, and when I step around, I just go straight to here, boom. And I sit down keeping his legs. So in that case, I don't have to actually pick him up and throw him for that variation. Yeah, the, import the important thing is to make sure that that you have learned the 100% proper technique on throwing somebody before you resort to this. Yeah, don't now, modify till you master. Yeah, and it, so the point is if you can master the other one, master it. You should always. Now, why well, not use this one? Well, good question. If, if I was in a situation where there were potentially multiple attackers and I threw the person and, and incapacitated him on the drop, that would allow me to get out of the situation more quickly, where if I fall down, you introduce a ground fight in a multiple attacker situation, which as we know is not a great idea. Fortunately, multiple attackers is not as common as one on one. It's not as common, but it's very it's problematic, possible. very possible. threatening. And we talked about many videos have broken this down, and there were even some questions on this. Multiple attackers, get out. Any art that says, no, we got you covered for multiple attackers, is deceivingly lying to you to engage in multiple attackers. No, you want to run as fast as you can. And if you get taken to the ground, get back to your feet as fast as you can. The problem is, Jiu Jitsu in its organic state does not teach you how to get back to your feet on the ground because there's no incentive to getting back up. It's just grappled until the fight's over. So check this out from the ground here against multiple attackers. If, so if I'm on the bottom of the guard, let's say he goes punchy, 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 punch, and I'm neutral at stage one and I'm protecting here and I'm like, oh man, his buddies are here. It's time to go. Check out what we're going to do. Sit up, knee shield, up, and we're up. Boom, and then boom, soccer kick. Yes or no? <laughs> I'm not that violent, you guys. Anyways, that was called the guard get up. There's another video I do with Kevin Gamboa, our CTC in uh, Makati City, Philippines, where we explain this in great detail. Multiple attackers, the number one lie in martial arts. You guys yeah. can check out that video and enjoy that. And, and the most important thing too is where, don't put yourself in situations where you're getting in street fights or multiple attackers, right? You should be, stay home. Well, as live we, the simple life. Live the Andrew Gracie Go to life. class, you guys, and come yeah. back. The only multiple attacker you should ever encounter is two guys trying to choke you at your Jiu Jitsu Academy class. Um, which is a good drill, by the way. There's a good video. Hidon. Hidon versus three. I've never done it. I don't think I will. Okay, that's what makes me the little brother. I'm just hanging tight, enjoying life. Hidon uh -huh. versus three blue belts who are legit, including my brother, who's a little shark. And, um, hold on. <laughs> And he, he tapped these fools out, it was amazing. Um, but regarding fighting and situations, regarding multiple attackers, one thing. Regarding single attackers, what's the rule? To avoid street fights at all costs, egos and alcohol. Show me a street fight that didn't include or, or, or get caused by egos or alcohol, and I'll show you a street fight that could have been avoided. Let's yeah. be real. And about the egos, is that anybody you're about to get in a street fight with, they don't want to fight. So if you can control your ego, you can bring some, some technique and some jujitsu into your conversation, you will help them, you will allow them to walk away. And that's what you told me. Hear yes. them and help them. Hear, Hear them and help them. Someone walks up to you, hey man, what the F? Your kid was playing over here, they knocked over my soda with their ball. Now my blanket's all wet, man. What the heck, man? It makes, I can see why you're so angry. Get your kids, man! I'm gonna talk to my kids, it's unacceptable. My soda, man! My, my soda, man! The truth is, if it's a little too crazy like this... Just clinch them? Not just clinch, and remember, and my <laughs> clinch meter is, uh, how do I say, it's... It's very... It's, it's a little more sensitive. That's interesting, I meaning like you're more likely to clinch than not... Than most people. Got it. I feel like I'm very okay with clinching, and I don't see me clinching you in that situation as a fight. I see, I see. If you're acting crazy around my children, and I clinch and I mount you, I say, listen, I'm sorry. After I clinch you, I'm going to say, I apologize, they shouldn't spill. There you go. Do me a favor and stop yelling at me and my kids. So I'm not fighting this person. I'm just talking to them well, it depends. with some you contact. If his homies are on the carpet with him... No, there's no homies on the Then carpet. it's a problem. You don't want to clinch him. One homie, two homies. That <laughs> Next question. <laughs> Jay. All right, so uh, Stephen Tony Michaels asked, how do you help your young child deal with the onslaught of unhealthy foods getting hurled at them constantly? How do you guys deal with it in your family? You go first, because you had them first. I followed your lead. Uh, unhealthy foods, the onslaught of unhealthy foods. Well, first of all, where are they coming from, these unhealthy foods? Marketing, TV, no, well, they don't watch restaurants. TV. Correct. That's a good point. How are they getting access? They, they don't really see the unhealthy foods. I'm talking school very sometimes, young. School sometimes. Two, three, four, five years old. Once you go to school, maybe. And yeah. some schools do give out, you know, treats and candy without parents' That's permission. True. It's ridiculous. But as for like, you know, 
unhealthy foods, my kids don't see anything. Yeah. They don't even know what out a cupcake sight, is. Out of sight, out of mind. You, here's the bottom line with kids and food. And this is the, every parent needs to hear this. And every parent hates to hear this. If it's in the house, it's in their mouth. Yes. And if it's that's in, the bottom line. And if it's in their mouth, you guys, they're good. They're, they sh they're going to eat it at some point and you've introduced it to them. So you have to defend your house against, and if it's on TV being thrown at them, whatever that commercial is, then technically it's in your house. That's your TV. And that's your house. That's their marketing brainwashing your child. So you got to be careful. What and, you're if you're, to see. and you, if your kids see you eating it, Ooh. if you're eating dessert at a restaurant, you're not know, the end of a meal. If you're at a party and you're eating a cupcake, it's, it's not tough. even in your house, but they're going to want it because you're eating it. So there's tough. No, it's all about what did they, what did Eddie Gracie do? What did Hardy on Gracie do? What did so many Gracies do? They lead by example. It's not the best way. It's the only way. Yeah, that's straight up. And to be honest, I avoided drugs, alcohol my whole life only because I knew that my ancestors, um, that the ones that I admired most avoided it as well. And I'm like, all right, if they got, if they were able to defend against that, I'm going to do the same thing and hope to give that same gift to my child. If they don't see me doing it, their desire to do it is going to be less. Now, the challenge is if it gets to a point where, especially as the kid gets older into teenage years, if the kid, right, and we admired our ancestors more than we admired any of our peers. Is that fair to say? Yes. Like our course. idols were our uncles and our dad and our grandfather. Those were our idols. So when our idols live and behave a certain way, we want to follow that path. Now, if I had friends, which I did uh, in high school and in, even in middle school, late middle school, who were smoking and drinking, and I idolized them more than my ancestors and my, my leaders and my teachers, if that was the case, then I would probably follow their lead, right? I would go do what they're doing. So the challenge is really the relationship between the parent and the child. If the relationship is dead, so is the influence. So the key is to keep that relationship so strong. And for us, we can only speak for us, one of the piece, strongest, uh, I guess, factors of glue that held the relationship together was jujitsu. And having jujitsu in a relationship so early is a bonding experience beyond simple self-defense. Yes, when my children go to a party and there's cupcakes and there's cake, before I get to the party, I'll explain to them, or before the cake comes out, there's a cake coming out, and most kids are going to eat it, but we don't eat it. It's not the healthiest cake. There are some better cakes out there. And this mm. happened with chocolate, mm. where she wanted chocolate, the neighbor had chocolate. I said, you know what? Let's find you some better chocolate. So what did I do? I bought her some 90% mm. like dark, chocolate. dark raw yeah. chocolate. She took one bite and didn't even like chocolate anymore. So now, <laughs> I always say, Val, if you want chocolate, let's have better chocolate. And she says, you know what? I don't really want any chocolate today. <laughs> because she remembers the bitter taste of the cacao raw. So we want next question. Ivanda, you had one for us? Yes, uh, what is his name? Can you go back there, please? Austin Vladimir, how do you escape a super tight side control where framing is not a realistic option? <laughs> I think this, I appreciate that. this question about escaping a super tight side control, this would make perfect sense and be very useful in a competition realm. That, right? Yeah, someone lands you have on the side. One minute left, you're down by two points. You have to escape yes. or you die and, and you let down your academy. And let's not even end your country. Your and country. your family. Your country. Yeah. Well, you're, it depends. If you're from your country, if you're fighting you're, for your country, country, you have no choice to get out. Now, the question is, what circumstance and priority are you fighting for? Well, but do you want to demonstrate some concepts real well, quick? Or I what? don't even really know if I have any, but I know I have one concept. And even in the competition realm, if you're able to lie still for 20 seconds, that will throw off anybody. Yes. Because they don't expect that. Anybody in a competition who controls true, you, they expect true. panic and movement. So lying still goes a long way. You have to try this. This is major. You have to try lying still. I'm gonna go a little lower. Escaping. I'm gonna go a little lower on this. This is major. You guys, what you're about to see right now may blow your mind. So if the internet gets affected during this process, I apologize. But this is gonna change everything for you. This concept. I have to go low. Sorry guys, we have the cheapest rig possible because uh, Eddie Gracie cheap. Day, and it was just the, the, the most efficient uh, rig to buy. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, so here's the deal. We land, and I'm like, oh, yes, we're like, oh, and he, he made it clear. Oh, there's no way, you guys. That's, you guys turning into me at this point. Remember, this person is not oh, punching you, and they're oh, not submitting you. Is this the grip? Is that the yeah, ultimate grip? Well, to prevent shrimping, yes. It's right. You're turning in. I'm going. This is competition. Like, I got you. I don't want anything but to hold you. Try to turn into me. Yeah, you can't. You can't. I got two grips. I'm inside. Double underhooks. Gee grabs. Chest to chest. Tight. Or you can go cross face underhook. Well, he gets someone good. He'll put you in the guard a little yeah. easier. Yeah, he mentioned no frames can yeah, enter. That front one is right. That's right. No, nothing can enter. Mm -hmm. Okay, you guys. So, so here's the deal. Go back to what you were saying, Bob. I, the thing is that he, showing something from down here right, is a actions. bad idea. Right. Even showing you something that might potentially work is a bad idea, unless you're already amazing 
And let's say I can tie your legs together with five belts. And you no problem. And you can defend all the guys in your school for three minutes each. All you their can attacks. If you can do that, then, then you have the right to learn something from down here. And chances are you can't do that, what he just asked right now, because we're all still working on it. And chances are what you are required to do to escape in this situation will expose you a little bit. Yes. Okay. Very difficult to go. Under. Yes. Well, that's the thing. It's the same as the guard, you guys. If you're inside my guard and you make up your mind, I have to break this tight guard no matter what. You're gonna get submitted yourself because of your desire to get out. Beautiful. The same is true for side mount. The same is true for side mount. That doing this is gonna cause you to mess yourself up. Here's the deal. Let me just say one thing, and hopefully it'll land. Victory presumes or requires opposition. Which means, if I side mount Hiro, and he opposes my side mount, he's fighting to the death to get out, my control is victorious. But if I side mount Hiro, and he accepts and patiently waits for my next move, my control, the actual control, is no longer victorious because it is not being contested. If you play soccer against no one, you did not win the game. There has to be a chance of defeat for the soccer game to be won. That's what's happening here. If I side mount Hiron and he tries to get out, I'm gonna be like, I got this fool. He's not, and I've had it a few times in my life, you guys, and I was like, just holding him for seven seconds was the biggest victory because he was uh, fighting against my control. So when I land here and he, and I'm like this in my death grip and I'm like, God, crossfade, and he stopped moving. My question is, for how long does victory last with no opposition? Finally, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna go submit this guy. Right, sorry. Well, just, then I start to get ready, and when I get ready to attack, that's my window for escape for Hiro. Well, the question is, why the tight side control? Why is that well, person using the tightest side control of all times? Well, to, to prevent the opposition, to prevent yes, the escape. Yes, so as long as you understand that, problem is solved. Well, Same there you go. an argument. So the only, the only side, yeah, no, sorry. Arguing with someone in the street. Yes. It's, right? You decide how long that argument, your wife. If you're arguing with your wife, how long do you wanna argue for? The moment you start listening, and validating her feelings and talking to her and understanding and seeing where you might have dropped the ball and owning some Accepting of your mistakes. Accepting the side mount. The argument is done. As soon as you accept the side mount, the side mount is done. <laughs> Next question. I have a, a, an escape right here that... that oh, now you're gonna go in? No, this is something that, it's been a long time. I just, someone asked me about this, uh, north, south. And I had, it's been a long time since even I have done this. Um, Elbows tight, go ahead. What's more common, over my arms? No, I want to be your body here. Here, yeah. under the arms, mm -hmm. great. So he's here, so I open his gi, and I bring my knee inside. Now I pinch his arm, oh. and I push him off. So that's something that, you know, I, I never ever use it, but I've been asked the question, you know, north, south, the guy's really, really tight, of course it's a gi move, I know that all of you guys. What if it's no gi, what if it's no gi? Don't even ask, it's not that move. But it is gi so often, and this could be useful for some of you. One more time, north, south. Henry said it. Henry said he wants to be, is this under or over? Oh, this is under your armpit. This yeah. is under my armpit, over my arms. So you shaking his gi open doesn't take too much. The gi is already loose in most cases. And then now I insert my knee like to here. I don't extend my leg like this, it would slip off. I extend it like this. So I enter it, I trap this arm, even my hand pushes. It's a very helpful move. Which, because nobody stays in the side mount long enough, I'm sorry, in the north-south long enough, cause why? Because I lie still, they move on. But sometimes the north-south becomes a place where somebody can stall even more because yes. they're further from your legs. Yeah, so they can stay away from the guard more. A good north-south escape. You guys, if you prevent, stop trying to get out of the side mount, they will start attacking. When they start attacking, they will create openings. When they create openings, that's when you escape the side mount. So the question, when you're in the bottom of the side mount, who's the onus on? Is the onus on you to escape or is the onus on them to submit you? The answer is the opposite of whatever position you're in. If I land side mount, I go, all right, it's your turn, he don't, you have to get out. I want him to fall for the bait. And if I land bottom of the side mount, I stop moving and say, okay, he don't, you gotta submit me. I'm cool right here, I'm cool. The only side mount that should be contested is the very first three seconds. Someone's passing your guard and they're coming around and you wanna keep guard for your own growth reason. I know you can go deep on that. Well, that's but, continuing the guard fight. But yes, yeah, correct, you keep them in yeah. the guard and try to submit them. But once they pass and they land and they stay up a side mount, for you to die trying to get out, competition or not, it's, it's not jujitsu. It's, it's not any great. It's not even jujitsu. It's not. Ivan, talk to us. Yeah, please. So here's the deal. 
we're talking about tournaments, right, and competition. And what I noticed when I when I start competing is that even though the time run out, assuming that I'm on, on the bottom of the side mount, and if the time runs out and I lose, I didn't lose. Meaning that people will give my my opponent medals. They will put it higher in the in the yes in the rankings, in the rankings on, on, the, on the podium. But I didn't lose. Like people are understanding that as victorious on that five minutes or seven minutes round. Right. But in the big picture of jujitsu, I was like, man, you know what? I'm just in third place right now. Yes. But I don't even know why this guy is celebrating. Right. That was in my mind because the jujitsu. Didn't submit you. No, didn't. Uh -huh. did I didn't spend my energy. Right. So even though society understands that if, if in a tournament, in a tournament, if you're down by a few points and they land side mounted and you lose at that moment by points. Yes. They, so, so it's up to you to to accept those rules. I see. What I said is Got that it. points in time only exist as a victory um, discussion if you acknowledge them. Yes. I never fought by believing that points or time existed. Interesting. So either I tap them, either they tap me. Whatever happened else, like besides that, something happened. I don't even know what. Right. I don't even know why they stopped the fight. Oh. I had energy. And I was alive, and I, you're the champion, you know? So yeah, it's true. It's that, the, truth it's, is, it's the, that, truth, the truth is what you believe is the truth, the, right? And it's that sacrificing the short-term goal of, or the short-term medal yes. for the long-term belt, belt, for the so long-term understanding. Knowledge and, and optimization of jiu-jitsu. And that's a good way for you to enter the tournament, and I, I would do the same thing. Yes. If I lose by seven points, I don't walk away feeling like I was defeated. Mm -hmm. But I do admit that I lost the game yes. that I agreed to play. Yeah. 100%. So yeah. they still won that game, but I don't feel like I've lost, you know, and this one is probably the healthy my mindset books. to have. If you're going to compete, it's the healthy mindset of, okay, I'm playing by these rules. The, the problems begin when those rules become the dictator of your style of jujitsu completely yeah. to where if you are in the bottom of the side mount, it's death. The same as death to you. And if you're there for more than 30 seconds, you're worth this trash on the face of the earth. Like if that's how you define yourself based on the... That's not a... That's not... You didn't create that. The circumstances created that mindset and that's what we concern for you guys. Nice. Next question. Thanks, Evandro. Uh, Wimpua asks, uh, what do you do when you end up on the floor with someone who pulls out a weapon? Tips for controlling the weapon at grappling range or disarming? That was a good question. Great question. Head has been waiting for that all seminar. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when the weapon gets introduced on the ground, it can go pretty deep. Um, but the general mindset is this. There is both top and bottom position. We'll cover when the weapon gets introduced from the bottom. As a general rule, I mean introduced from the top. As a general rule, if I'm, if I'm here, he don't on top of me, and suddenly I wake up, and he starts stabbing me from here, and he's stabbing the ribs, the mindset is very simple. You want to close the distance, right? So I want to get my knees in between us, boom. Tightening the rope right here. And then while this is happening, I'm working in here, and the goal for me in a weapon situation from the bottom of the fight is 1.5. This is it, get him in the guard no matter what it takes. Wrist control, head control. And then from here, pull the weapon away, got him. Stab me, got him. Now watch, we're gonna use the knee, straighten it, and we're gonna lock him in right here, boom. Now hip out, cross over, and arm lock. So it doesn't matter if you don't side mount him, even if he's mounted, use the back like this and stab him here. Isn't it interesting, it's just like punches. If he's stabbing from the mount, look, I wanna go to the same side so he puts his hand out, and then my knees come in. I thrust at his hips, I get to straight two. Two becomes 1.5, I wanna get into this. This is your goal, yes. This is everything. If you're on the bottom of the fight and someone has a knife, your goal is 1.5. And you will have the jiu-jitsu expertise to be able to maneuver your body here from any position as long as you know this is your final destination. And once you land here, head control, arm control, straighten the leg and use the knee to knock it forward, right? The customary kimura, you have a hand and you sit up, right? The problem is that is it requires Hito's arm to be too loose. Well, I'm rip it out for real. Rip it up. I think you can get it out. Rip it out for real. He yeah. can't get it because I have counter pressure. So now I take my leg, I straighten it, because and my north knee knock. And he passes my head to the side. Correct, because if you don't, if you do this and you try to go here, you're gonna run into this, you won't be able to. This is a GST, this is one of our law enforcement techniques, GST level two actually, Jiu Jitsu in general, but very highly applicable for police officers who may be in a ground fight against someone who kind of brandishes a knife. So they're here, and then from here, straight leg, look. And the key is this little head flick to make sure he don't, his head doesn't hit me. So I go one, two, three, and I got it right here, boom. Go to double monkey grips as we land. You're gonna get cut. Cut the leg right there, it's gonna cut your leg, your knee, his back a little bit, you're gonna kick off his hip, turn, and you got it right here, boom. And then once he surrenders and drops the knife right here, we always can come down. I'm turning this. Right. I don't want you to get my knife back. After the knife is, he's dropped, you go get the knife, boom. And then of course, what you do is yours to choose from. Cool? And, and the knife is worst case scenario, right? Worst case. You'd rather scenario. fight somebody who has a gun or a knife. You would like, grapple with a gun or a knife. Worst case scenario. The knife. The knife. We now don't you want guys, the knife. Here's the deal. 
We could keep going with the regular questions, but we do have a special guest visitor today. Okay, many of you know him as T City, but he recently moved to G City, Guillotine City. Brian, come on in. Our guy is here, you guys. He snuck around the back of the garage at Hedon's house, and he's here. Take off your bones and your bones. Oh, efficiencia, bro. Welcome, Brian, to the party right here. Getting low and tight. Tuck and roll, Brian. Talk to him. <laughs> Tuck and roll. Tuck and roll. No, we tuck and we roll. Tuck, just heavy efficient. But anyways, Brian's here, you guys, fresh off his fight of the night performance with uh, Renato Moicano. Just a savage, savage fight. And uh, we got some questions for Brian rolling in. We can let him answer either technique or mindset. Um, but just dope, man. Good to see you on a Sunday. How's everything? Good. 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 So, Brian, talk to us, our friends all over yeah. the world, training jiu-jitsu, and some of them uh, a little bit dubious about the effectiveness of the basics at the high level. Be honest about it in terms of you, in terms of what you use when you get in there regarding distance management and, uh, and the concept you apply in the cage. No, I mean, I think, I think they, they feel like I, I, uh, I changed my style or things, but the truth is I just, as long as you, for me, as long as I grasp any concept, you can always... You know, like your 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 style and your the way your movement is will be different, but if you still have the same concept, you know. The principles. So for yeah. me, it's like the principles stay stay deep, and then that's the way. It's still you know, it's all it's all jujitsu still. It's all jujitsu. It's all waiting them out, waiting for them to get tired, and then when they make a mistake, I take advantage of it. And, and yeah, that's, that's jujitsu right there. That's well, a good point. Yeah, and I, this is amazing to discuss right now is that Brian has the most third consecutive round, third round finishes. The third round finishes, and the moment that that. It was a tweet sent out about yes. this from Fox Sports or whatever, and I said, "Wow, this is this is so jujitsu." Even though it's not the best thing for the sport, because obviously the sport, they want first round boomers. Well, it's a gamble. It's a yeah. gamble. But the thing is that he, he's making jujitsu proud because he's not in a hurry to win. He's allowing them to lose the fight. Right. And in many of them, right, your opponent. I don't think Brian went crazy to win. Right. In the right. last. 40 seconds or a minute and a half. That's not how he won those fights. No, people yeah. made a mistake. They needed Clay Guida. Might have been a little bit, you know, you going forward, but it worked out. Yeah, the way he described it to me is that no, he was he was time he timed. He saw Clay doing the same thing learned, over and over. Yes. Going down. And and that's what's cool is that even when Brian wins by knockout, he's applying the jujitsu mindset of yo, the pressure is not on me to annihilate these stronger, crazy mm -hmm. little guys in a short amount of time. The pressure is on them to try to beat me, and once they can't beat me, I'll figure them out. And how many times have we been in that no, third round? That's like the same thing too. Like you said, like, you know, let's say someone keeps putting their arm out, right? Eventually, mm -hmm. they say next time he puts his arm out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab that arm and use the arm lock. Well, same true. thing when they keep yes. ducking their head down. You're like, well, next time he ducks his head down. Or Morcano, who shot in for that one time when he got desperate after in the end of the second round, then you knew if I can make him desperate again, he'll shoot again. Yep. So Brian is learning, and how many times we've gone into the third round where Brian, because the thing is, you're just meeting these guys for the first time. Everyone who's watching us right now trains jiu-jitsu somewhere and they love jiu-jitsu and they roll with their buddies all the time. The problem is when you roll with your same training partners every day, you get the privilege of knowing them and being familiar with them. The problem is that that's not realistic when you guys go fight in the cage. You never met this guy, never touched this guy before and you guys are about to get down right now. And he's been trained to beat you. This whole life. Just off like, you know. Just watching video. everything. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, a really, it's a really crazy engagement and, and for Brian to go in there and in the short time that he has, he only has 15 minutes, to learn those guys in 15 minutes is really a remarkable feat. Learn them yes. enough to where by the end, cool. use their own uh, aggression against them, essentially. Yes, and a little bit, not to take it away from him, but a little bit of learning is being done even before the fight. Yes. Because yes. you're watching their videos. This is true. Their previous fights. And just you saying that made me think about UFC 2. One, two, three. Especially number two, right? It had 16 fighters. 16, four fights in one night. So there's night. four fights in how it was a tournament, and you don't even know who you're going to fight because you don't know you who's going to win. You can't prepare for 16 guys. You don't it's know who's like, going to win. That's the same as preparing for 100 people. So it's just almost like, what do you think about that? Like, imagine, you know, eight guys in the bracket, all similar weight. you got to fight three in one night. You don't know who's going to win in the bracket before you, so you don't know who you're going to face and how your fight's going to be. No, it's, it's crazy, man. Because it's Brian crazy. has been in fights, and many fighters today, where you get in fights, and that's part the sport calls for this. Right. Where after the fight, you're a little banged up. Your knees, your yeah. shoulders, you're tired. It's a battle, it's a war. And because guys are getting better, everybody's getting better. But yeah, like back in the day, I remember I did the, the closest thing I would say to that experience would be pancreation. Mm -hmm. We had pancreation tournaments where it was palm strikes. Multiple. And it was multiple opponents. And I missed the weight class, the two weight classes. 
So I was like 17, weighing 140, and I had to fight these guys who were like 175 to 185, mm -hmm. like real men. Men, yeah. yeah. And it was like, I got through the first guy, and then I was all happy, and then you're like, don't celebrate, you got like three more to go. <laughs> Crazy. So it just shows, once again, I'm just highlighting the importance of pacing yourself, right. of defending yourself, of not going out there to kill the person, but just simply survive. Because you don't even know what's, your body what's in right. store for you right around the corner. Right. And that's the whole basic diet talk, which is always, and not basic diet, and just eating healthy, taking care of yourself, always uh -huh. being ready to go. Listen, Brian questions. Brian, <laughs> separate, yeah, can we bring Mike in for that one? Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, uh, so the question bro. Was, bro. <laughs> no, that, no, no, not even about the basic diet, but no, just always being ready. I know. Taking he's care working of yourself. Every day is getting better. Oh, yeah. Brian's a purple belt in nutrition. Yeah. You guys have another question for I Brian? Know. Yes. Uh, Lesser John is asking, like, what are some ideas for rehabbing knee injuries, shoulder injuries? Especially right now, we guys are talking about that. Like, how do you recover from that? We're still training, not training. How do you feel that, Brian? I always say it depends on the level of, of injury. You know, like these guys always show me, like if you're injured, but you can still like just tuck your hand in and roll, like you can do that. Maybe you can tie your legs and kind of roll and just use all upper body defenses. But um, well, that's being able to still roll. But yeah, while I was say it depends how. how like, We're talking about level. helping rehab the injury, helping yes, get the injury better. better. There's good guys. Well, no, you gotta go after help. And Brian knows about. He had shoulder surgery. You know, he was out for quite a time. And, and Brian knows well about the process. So, and he did it right. He rehabbed it. He did the workouts. He did the exercise. And when he was working on his shoulders, he's doing everything else. Running. I, he's just incredible. Staying in shape for that process to make sure that he's. I would right. imagine that when it comes to rehab uh, and just any kind of taking care of yourself, do the full thing. Yeah. Take the full. I had ten rest. months off. I hurt my back. Did ten months off. I felt okay Don't after six. It. I felt okay after six, but I was like, nah. This is my life. I can't afford yes. not to. I just got to do it. I just got to do it. It's, it's too hard. easy to start again. Jiu Jitsu is so addicting. Like, oh, I'm feeling 80%. Let me roll. And it's not. Don't do that. Take your time. Jiu Jitsu is not going anywhere. Cool. Yeah. Any other technique questions, concept questions here, Jay? Tom is asking, what is your preferred preferred way to escape the triangle from the back once it's locked in. <laughs> Wait, who's, tri who's triangle are we talking about? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Escape the triangle from the back? Yeah. Triangle from the back. So the like on the ground? Like locked, locked up? So we do it. So yeah. So there yeah. is... Uh, so Brian, Brian, lock it up on Hedon. Untie the legs? Yeah, so Brian and it catches the inverted triangle here. The reverse triangle. Yeah, that's the cool. Uh, that's cool. I think we'll roll up to this side. It's okay. Lock it up. The reverse triangle, okay? First of all, how did this happen, right? What happened was the legs were crossed over here, Brian. Cross your legs over here, Brian. Like this. It started with the feet crossed, hugging that arm, right? And then at some point, you had to grab your foot and pull it across his neck. Go back. Freeze. Let's go back. That's where it should have been saved. So he don't do not that what he wants to know. He wants the, to know fully the death locked. Escape. The death escape. Yeah, of course. Well, this do is... you think he would benefit from this? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> my, my point is, I've been here a few times in my life with he don't, where I got to the feet crossed, but I've never actually caught the rear triangle, reverse triangle fully locked. It's never happened. And the, you guys want to know, how does he don't prevent that progression from taking place? So he'll demonstrate that now. How do I do it? Well, you just didn't let this foot ever get across. So Brian's there. Got it. Going to grab that. His leg stays crowding out. Crowding the area. Crowding that and grabbing this right here. And Brian's trying to distract and trying to get the arm and make it get that way. That foot can pull across his body. But as long as he don't know what the priority is right there, look at that, holding the foot, keeping it away. He don't know that Brian's other leg has to lock onto his own ankle. But pushing and fighting hands and keeping the leg from pulling across, right? Yes, if he gets inside, he's good to go. Now, if he locks it up, here's what I always tell people if it gets locked up. You're not going to escape belly up. You're not going to escape this from your back. You, Because what happens is, when Brian's on his back, he has free hands. Lay down, start pushing, grabbing arms. There's things Brian can do. His hands are free to do stuff. What he don't need to do is get Brian's hands out of the fight, and he does that by getting to his knees. The problem is, going to his knees is hard to do. So watch him fake one way, bridge into that way. He don't first, then come towards me. Resist, Brian, resist. And then he goes up to his knees this way. Now, he starts clearing the foot, and then peeling the other foot and pulling it up. that slower? That was awesome. That was great. You guys, rule on the triangle from the back. Always get to your knees before beginning the disentanglement. One more time. So fake into him, resist, Ryan, resist, you know, goes up, boom, and he gets to here. Now keep it, look at this. All he don't need to do is go here. Sometimes you can do it that way, go back, that was awesome. Sometimes I'll take my hand and I'll knife inside of it. Do it again, do it again. So Brian's foot's kind of tucked, he don't knife hand, and then he mounts on that leg, then he finds the heel on the other foot right there, and starts pulling the, uh, literally disin, disin, uh, untangling the triangle completely. It's the same as like a rear naked choke. Right, right. You have to. The someone asked this too. Someone asked the full rear naked Put the hooks in, Brian. Someone asked the full lockup here. Face the camera a little bit right there. You're everybody, good. not everybody, but it's it's very normal to want to go here. Right. But when you understand the choke, you understand that the weakness is here. Right here. Go ahead. The hand. The you hand. Fight the hand. And of course, the sooner the better. Like he wraps my neck. Other side, better for you, right? I'm yeah. already here. Like well, you did something right there that I, you didn't tell them about. Well, yeah. Here, but you, Brian felt it. Brian, tell them what you felt. I cheated. The minute you shot the neck, what'd you feel? 
He didn't let me put the hand behind. So Hedon is taking his head and he's driving it into Brian's chest. Now normally, if someone wraps your neck, what do you try to do? Touch your chin and touch your chin. When you touch your chin, you create the gap for Brian to lock it in. And then if you tuck it in right here and your arm goes over Hanayaya style and you lock it up right here, you're gonna get your face choked and your chin choked into your face. So Hedon does the opposite, yeah, which so is lift your... his neck up. And now Brian's trying to find an entry of his hand behind the neck and he can't and then the disentangling happens yeah. little by little in the hand. Tucking your chin is not as important as you think it is. It's not as valuable. It doesn't work as well as you think it does. Well, yeah, so here's the, there's the rule. You tuck your chin until the wrap happens. The second there's a wrap, the second hand getting behind, the same, Wait. the same significance the first hand has under your neck, the second hand is behind the neck. They're the same. So when someone goes to wrap your neck, tuck your chin to stop it and fight in the beginning. The second he gets past your hands and he's there, you should be putting your head back and fighting the second hand from going behind your head. So whether the wrap happens under the chin or, or on the chin, same. you forget about the chin tuck yes. and you yes. grab the hand. No, correct. Yes. Correct. 100%. 100%. And the only reason I'm saying tuck the chin before that is because if you're here, if you don't hand, like just move forward a little. If you don't hand, if I'm here, I'm doing just like over under and you shoot my neck, wrap it up. Wrap around my chin. But having my chin tucked, I can just at least get back one second real quick. I'd rather you land on my chin and then me rip it out, than you go straight in and you grab onto something. That's all I'm saying. So it buys me a little more time. Now, if he wraps clean over the chin, boom, start pulling this hand out. That's when I start putting my head back and start, look at this, go put your hand behind my head. There's no way, because my head is back and I'm fighting fishing for this. Yes. Now, the only problem with all of this is if he gable grips, now it's a bad situation. Then you go right for the hypo, uh, for the enar eminence. You grab one, grab the grabber tight. But turn a little bit. Mm -hmm. So right here, he's gable grip and he's tight. I go as high as I can. I find his phenar eminence, which is the meaty part of the thumb. I hook it. He's gonna be strong here. And I can't grab it with two hands, but if I grab here tighter, you know? Mm -hmm. If I hold one and I grab my own arm, look, two. Mm -hmm. And then I put my frame in. So yeah. I do one, two, and which works and that's where those well. lat pull downs, you guys. Those lat pull downs in my come back. Into play. In my back. And oftentimes too. Mike is right over there watching <laughs> Rose. So Another here. thing too, like when you wrap my neck, go ahead right there again, wrap it up, pump the gable grip. Boom, hooks are in. Uh, when you're, it's, we're here, it's understanding. Um, you're good, you're good, you're good. Understanding this. Yeah. The turn. Understanding how to turn your shoulders and roll out. Sometimes the choke. best choke defense is a repositioning of your body relative to theirs. And you can do that while you're fighting the hands. It's true, right? And most people who lock a rear naked choke, I tested this uh, a couple of days ago. Lock the rear naked other hand, sure. other side. The strong side. Yeah, most people who lock the choke, they squeeze with just their arms. Their legs are sleepy. Like huh? the hooks are in, medium in, medium. Right. Have more sticky hooks. Yeah, and now squeeze with your arms. I feel this, more squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. Mm -hmm. Now, instead, shoot your feet down, thrust your hips through me. Yeah, it's right. twice as fast. Right. So because most chokes are done, we don't want to count on this, but they're done, I want to say a little bit impatiently, and they're they're so focused on winning with just the arms. They lose a battle down you there. You have more time than you think to go back, grab the hands, and turn. Where most people, I think, when they're caught in the rear naked choke, they feel like, oh, it's done. Right. It's not the case. If you reach back and you start turning, it will it'll it'll pan out more often than not. That's what's up. You guys hit that share button. Let's get some more people in the party here. Another question. Yeah, Michael is asking how to handle overly aggressive training partners. Dang. Over. Over aggressive. Well, who's asking? Mike Everett? No, Michael Stinson. <laughs> Michael Stinson is asking. Overly aggressive training partners. Um, overly well, aggressive. I, there have been people that ha I've rolled with that have done things to me that pissed me off, especially when I was much younger, 23, 25 years old. I would come to my father, like, he's pulling my fingers and doing this on my face and elbow in mm. my eye. So, overly aggressive. You're right, it's very frustrating, uh, especially when you want to create a nice back and forth and a, I want to say somewhat of a, a fair, uh, respectful role. Right. But in my stage right now, there's right. no overly aggressive. Right. If somebody comes and rolls with me from out of town or wherever and they're going for some random heel hooks, people, you know, going for wrist locks, peeling my fingers, there's no, I'm not, they're not going over aggressive. They're almost helping me. Mm. So to some degree, you know, as you become more advanced in your purples and brown belts, when someone is overly aggressive, it doesn't make me more aggressive. Mm. I don't get mean. I just, I'm, I'm grateful. They're exposing me to these crazy things. It could be a neck crank. It could be going from my shin, driving their shin across my shin, pe pulling on my foot in a weird way to hurt my ankle. Right. And that's because the level that you've reached that. Yes. It's almost like you can manage them like with a smile on your face. Well, that's no, human's no, ability. Not a, not a smile. Well, with a, with a, with yeah. a smile on your heart. 
So the Hidon has this ability to just manipulate you, and even though you went crazy, he's not really trying against you and now. It, it's not even Hidon, it's most people that are very advanced yes. and great. But the first people who are asking are not. Of course. No. So the question, if you're a lower level, if you're a blue belt or a purple belt, and you're rolling and someone is too aggressive, a training partner. It's dangerous. It's dangerous. And the truth is, they need to know. That's the reality yes. is that, like at the academy, when someone gets a reputation for being unsafe, and it's very simple. Here's how we like to explain it. If this is your technical ability, and this is your physical ability, meaning you're an athlete, superstar, super crazy athletic, but your technique is just here. You're just kind of figuring this stuff out. This gap is called the liability gap. This is your liability gap between your technical and your physical ability. That's how much of a liability you are to yourself and your training partners, okay? Now, if this is your physical ability and this is your technical ability, like Hedon's is, this is called your gentility gap. This is how gentle you're capable of being while making people feel like they can't do anything to you. That's where you want to get. You want to get to where your technique is so much better than you are, right? So you can be in great shape, but you want to be a black belt in jiu-jitsu and you might be a purple belt in fitness. And if you're a black belt in fitness, you want to be a red belt in jiu-jitsu. So my point is you want to get to that point where your technique is way beyond your physical ability. Now, in the time while you're pretty new and you're pretty athletic and you're pretty savage and you're new to jiu-jitsu, let's say you played college football and now you're a, you're a blue belt with one stripe and you're a beast and you're sparring with people, you're a major liability because this is your technique, this is your physical. And all I'm saying is that when this exists, this equation, it's a liability for everyone, including themselves, and what need, they need to be notified. And what I tell the people who I have to have these talks with, which I do often, not often I would say, but occasionally I have to have these talks with people who are liabilities to the training environment, I say, listen, it's very simple. Either you roll within your technical ability or you take a break from rolling. I keep it very real. Yeah, One I mean, month, two months, just watch for a month. The question just is, observe and how, see. How many people are we willing to let that aggressive explosive crazy what was the word that you used yes out of control yes. training partner hurt how many how many students should you lose because of one student not even one right so for sure if one is lost it's one too many we might as well lose that person yeah, we, yeah they're a liability you might as well lose them and before. there's and let's be very clear there's a very distinct difference between an accident in training and uh an injury that occurs due to someone's complacency or lack of safety consciousness big difference I could be rolling and then someone sprawls out next to me and they step on my face and they, you know, give me cauliflower ear or cut my face. That's someone stepped on my face, an accident. Or I could be trying to pass someone's guard with so much priority on the pass and so much disregard for safety that as I pass, my elbow hits this person in the face and it cuts them. That's yeah. me putting victory beyond the safety of my training partner and that's when I become a liability. If victory is more important than your partner's safety, you're a liability and you shouldn't be sparring with those people because they're not there to serve you, they're there to help you grow and they need to be treated as such as assets that they are. Yes, if, if you're thinking, you know, it's only a matter of time before that guy hurts me, it's already gone too far. You need to stop rolling with that person. And, and if you train at our school, tell one of us. Yes, and your ability to tell your training partner, say listen, because when you come to me, you're right. the overly aggressive, crazy person, you say, hey, let's roll. I can say, you know what, matter of fact, today I'm not feeling like rolling with you, you're actually very good. And the way that you roll, I'm just not prepared to match your intensity right now. And it wouldn't be safe. Thank yeah. you so much. It's nice. That's it. Very real. Right. Very real. You should be able to tell them that. Sometimes you feel like you're obligated to roll with somebody just because they ask you. Like you have to say yes. Well, you put especially, the especially, yeah. Especially if they're a higher belt. Yes. Purple belt. I'm a blue belt. He wants to roll. He's 50 pounds heavier. Mike is good at this. Yes. Mike will defer from people that are kind of crazy strong and much protect heavier himself. Yeah. Just to keep himself is safe. Is there a responsibility that if someone who's a black belt asks a brown belt or a purple belt asks a blue belt to roll, does the lower belt have to roll? Well, listen, no one has to roll with anybody. Yeah. And I myself, as a black belt, it could be a 280 pound, 300 pound blue belt. Right. You know, let's roll. No thanks. I'm not feeling like you. I'm not feeling like you. <laughs> yeah, you true. don't make sense for me right now, but it doesn't mean that I won't give you a roll another day. Let me get warmed up. Let me get over my knee injury, whatever it may be. That's what's up. And um, anyways, and talk about, uh, Mike, come on over here, please. I'm gonna introduce our friend, Mike Safai. Many of you already know him. Um, fitness black belt, Jiu-Jitsu brown belt. Uh, overall homie and great person and just, um, just an awesome guy and Mike on this subject is very interesting because besides what he don't just mention which is deferring and saying No, I don't feel like rolling with you because Mike like more more than the average YouTube practitioner Mike really protects his body and people look at him because he's in such physical amazing shape But he has the, the highest level of protectiveness and obsession ultimately with protecting his joints and his body and training safely So he can go as long as he can tell him where this came from and, and why it's so important. Well, it's actually the limitation of being muscular so 
I first, you know, actually the reason why I started training was to maintain good cardiovascular fitness and a good midsection. And I realized that like thinner people naturally have better dexterity. And so like my shoulders, my elbows, and things like that, uh, even my hips, I'm very like uh, tight within those areas are limited. So you see these guys and they roll. I actually have like, these like reference points. I call people squares when they first start, meaning they're really rough around the edges. And then I call these people, like the black belt circles, because they're so smooth and fluid. I'm happy to be an octagon, <laughs> yeah. meaning I have little curves. <laughs> but he has some rough edges. I do. And that's like the trade between bodybuilding. No, he's being humble. He's a little more like a circle. He's I, a little more he's super smooth. But you know what though? But yes. He's, least, he's a non-agon. I, ha <laughs> I have to try <laughs> harder than they do, basically. Yes. Because it's very perishable for me fluidity so it's something that I have to continue to work on and uh, I tap early all the time super smart on the taps he yeah, taps. I learned that from him it's like you got his arm isolated up ah, I'm good I'm good I'm good yeah and I think he knows that besides the fact that it's protecting his joint he's like the fact that you isolated my arm is enough for me the fact that it's out of the fight I don't want to have to if I fight use my strength and get it back in it's cool but it's not the real victory the real victory is preventing that from happening it's funny. To me. and bringing that back to our grandfather he's the same like if you get caught and your back is taken and the neck is wrapped like 90% even though I might have escaped a choke or a triangle, in, I, in his eyes, I already lost. Right. He's already driving. The car ride home isn't about how I won by an arm lock a minute later. Right. It's like, yeah, that triangle you're in, you lost. You shouldn't have been there. Right. So, right. So him tapping before the submission happens means that he already accepts the defeat. That he lost. The isolation and the defeat. So mm -hmm. cool. The now, what I want to say, Mike is exceptional as well. Mike is my personal trainer. We work out together all the time. I'm getting in better shape. I've never been in such good shape in my life, and I feel great because of it. And I always tell him, I say, Mike, I've never felt when I roll, I've never felt my joints and my body feel so safe because I'm working out. I'm stronger. Not that I can like lift bigger guys and bench press bigger beasts off of me. My darses are a little tighter, not going to lie. But um, it's just a matter of my joints feel like they have more protection in where they are, which just feels amazing. And for anybody out there who has curious or questions, hit up Mike on Facebook. You can find him. Uh, or Instagram, and he'll be glad to help. But just regarding the type of training that is recommended for someone who's trying to optimize their their, their fitness for jujitsu. Um, but that being said, uh, Mike is amazing. Also, at going to the academy after a hard day's workout, which he does professionally, and just like choosing the the blue belt or the the woman who's much lighter than him and much smaller, and he'll just roll with the smallest, lightest person. And talk about those days when you show up and you don't feel like rolling with any beast and how you manage those days and why, why you do that. Why are you even, why are you still there? Why yeah. why are you there to roll with somebody who's 145 and three pounds lower? Yeah, because I think it maintains your fluidity and your timing. And I remember you guys told me a long time ago that uh, if you can't do an arm lock on a kid, you can't really do an arm lock because if you're throwing the leg over and you're hitting their face, it just means that you're sloppy. Mm -hmm. But if you can do it gracefully <laughs> to where you don't even hit a child or somebody more fragile, then you really have the technique developed. And so. Basically, I only have in my mind two days that I prefer to go intense because all the other days I've, I'm really like I spread myself thin between fitness. So I come in there and I try to get, dedicate two days. Sometimes the ego takes me a little further, where like I'll have a hard round just because I feel like no, like this is not the day. You can't give it up right now. Yeah. Yeah, but for the most part, in a perfect world, if I can go two hard days and then the remaining days I can just be fluid and be smart with who I train with then not only do I maintain the other side, which is to you know develop strength and not burn myself out, because your nervous system will break down, but I also, I've gotten better that way because things slow down to where I can see more. The way I describe it is this, if you are spear fishing and just looking to kill, you don't see as much as you do when you're snorkeling. You're on top and you're just kind of cruising. I get to see everything and I don't really have to worry about being injured and like I said, it, you know what, it develops more camaraderie too with certain people. That's so what's up. I feel like in, in, on top of everything, he's staying connected to the building. Right. Because most people who do jujitsu, they want to be in the building four, five, six days a week. But they, they want to kill every kill every time. And I, I wonder if that's part of the reason why they're not training after two, or three, that they four, stop all together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. They quit, they quit training. Mm -hmm. So he's pacing himself, and the same goes for how that's you a work good point, out. You guys, if you go to the gym and you lift heavy, I don't know, I don't lift heavy, but if you go to the gym and lift heavy five days a week, it's unsustainable. There's problems, and I would imagine that there are some guys that want that. They want the results yeah. that they think they're going to get lifting five days a week. But where I'm sure Mike is somebody who he might have very, very heavy days. The same way he has heavy rolling days, he has heavy lifting days, and then he has other days where the the workout is almost like a game. He's playing. Like, the way. I saw you the other day with Jean Paul. Like you guys are bouncing tennis balls. Yeah, yeah. And moving around, and like you look at that, and you're like, they're not working it's out. The same as jujitsu. You yeah. gotta try it, or jump roping, or just hopping over. It's the simplest things that 
they, they, they are a workout, but they're not the workout right. that, that most people think they want. So what's cool is that Mike has given himself permission to pace himself in jiu-jitsu, to be in jiu-jitsu and to not feel like he has to give it 100% and kill or be killed every single day. And I think a lot of blue and purple belts early in the journey, they're a little bit hesitant about you know, doing jujitsu and going to class and everyone's sparring and they're not giving it 100% or just saying, hey, I'm just gonna watch the sparring today. That's totally okay, you guys, you gotta pace yourself. But I think that it did take Mike a while to give himself permission to do what he's doing now. And that's what's crazy is that Vicky yes. came to a brown belt and he's a good friend of ours. Imagine what a blue belt uh, is feeling who's just coming in there and feeling like I gotta impress Whoa. everyone in this room. I used to feel like if I wasn't destroyed when I left, I didn't do a good job. Interesting. Yeah. And you know what's crazy that you come to class, right? How many people have, you know, been at work or been at home or wherever throughout their day and they're like, you know what, I don't want to go to jujitsu today. Why are they saying that? I don't feel like it. And then they say, but I'm going to go anyways. Right. Right? And they're saying that because they're tired. Mentally or physically, they're exhausted. Who knows what's happening in their lives, right? They're stressed out. They say, you know what, but I'm going to go anyways. And they get there. And when they get there and it comes time to spar... What is expected of them in the sparring portion of class? That's the question. That's the question. And, and when they find a partner, their partner, we don't know what day their partner's on. Right. Is their partner on a light day? Right. Or is their partner on Savagery. a, I'm hungry and I need to finish someone today. Right. So you, I'm sure, have had light days, but you see Turned somebody, someone. they walk over to you and yeah. their gi's falling out of their body. You know, their geese coming off their like, belt, oh, no. and they're dragging their belt, and their mouthpiece is like hanging out of their mouth. Like, Mike, you want to go? And what do you say? <laughs> no. You say no. Yeah. Now, that's the thing is that you don't have to roll with everybody. Know when to say no. Know when to say no. Ask the person, how are you feeling listen. today? And, of course, we can't always trust what they say. Yeah, how are like, you? Listen, I'm going to go easy right now. And then it's like, boom! Yes, and it's crazy. Know your training partners. Ask them, how are you feeling? You know, check if they have their fiancé or their new girlfriend in the stands. And they're Watching. trying to impress their girlfriend. Don't roll with them. Don't roll with them if you want to have a light day. <laughs> yeah, actually, it's reversed. Because sometimes on my light day, I'll go up to somebody. I'll be like, hey, you want to roll? I don't want to take away this roll. I want to go light today. Like, I'll actually say it like, you know. And then what do they say? Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they like, don't oh, trust you. They, they say no, you're just no, wrong. Sometimes they want it a little bit more, and it's like, like, like Sam will be like, okay, no, I'll go with someone else. <laughs> he knows they better. want something heavier. Because I yes. want it. when I want it light, I want it light. You mean it. Got it. So listen, let's take let, too much talking. Time to get into a technique, technique. here. And the technique I want to show, since Mike is here, is one that he, this is one of the um, few but awesome techniques that Mike actually kind of innovated and shared with me. And, um, Share yeah. with me. He created it essentially. I didn't. No one had taught me this before. It's just a one-handed guillotine. But where he's setting it up from, and now I'm catching everyone in it. Oh, it's back. Oh, thank God, we're back, you guys. We thought we lost you. Bring it back. We're good. Okay, this is that was very close last time, right before the broadcast. It ended. It ended. Anyways, so um, show us the guillotine. Yeah. So the actual guillotine. Uh, Mike, lift your head that way, please. That he actually shared with me. And then I've just messing with it so much. And since then, I'm telling you right now, this is the easiest guillotine I'm catching right now. I'm catching a lot of Darces, Anacondas, but from a guillotine perspective, this is how they're tapping. Side mount, underhook, easy to get. Boom. I need this arm pin right here, so I use my hips. I lay on it, smash it down, grab the wrist, bring my knee inside. I switch my other shin and end up right here in this side mount kind of crucifix control. At this point, he doesn't like that he's exposed to strikes or punch or throat grabs or elbows to the face. So he starts to turn on his side, start turning. He does this. This is very normal. They turn and they lift their head up. At that point, I bring my arm and I want to shoot my hand until my wrist and my thin are eminence are right in his artery. Like not that deep, just right there on one side. So I'm only plugging one of Mike's arteries, nothing on this side. So my wrist hits one side, hand on the ground, elbow on the ground, head on the ground. And now here's the magic. I'm going to bring my other knee, watch. I'm going to tripod and bring my knee over his arm. Getting rid of this arm was the big breakthrough. So from here, I shoot, I put my head down, I tripod, my knee comes over. Now at this point, do not sit your hips through. What you wanna do is straighten your leg and open your hips out flat to the mat, hand on the ground, and then just lay your rib cage into his artery while you lift his head off the ground. So I can see on this side over here, <laughs> your, um, your body is laying on your hand. Oh, completely. My hand is open like this so and my body sandwich. It's a one-handed guillotine, but this hand is connected. Super connected. It's as if you were holding your gi, but you're not. It's as if I was grabbing my and hand. You can do it no gi. Now, there's one variation on this one that I kind of innovated here um, that came as a result of guys like Mike being so strong. They got this hand back in front and started pushing my pelvis away. So let's say I did it correctly here. I did this. I shot this. 
Okay, and when I do the tripod, my knee passes over. If Mike's hand gets inside, the problem is now I can't melt my hips to squeeze. Push my hips a little, bro. Now I have no leverage. So watch what we do. This leg comes in, boom, and I go here. Now I push my hips away. Too late. Yeah. So here's the bottom line. If the hand is isolated, side mount. If the hand reintroduces to the hip, mount. Why? Because the most important thing is that my hips can do what they need to do. And if he's blocking my hips, he can only block them from perpendicular. When I mount, that frame doesn't have the same applicability. Look, there's no frame. And I have his neck wrapped with a full sandwich, and it's a done deal. So a one-handed guillotine. So how deep is the wrap? Barely. It's just right here on one artery. Correct. So go back. Let me see. It's not that far of a shot. Look, the same. Yeah, watch, watch. You it's don't right want here. to go deeper is not better. My hand is facing Mike's pet. It's not even across his neck. Deeper is not better is what I'm saying. No, you can right go here. too deep. Right here. Yeah, I don't. Can you go too deep? Well, here, the, the need to go deeper than you actually have to is what causes you to be unsuccessful at the shallowness that you could be successful in at. In this guillotine and the one we hold hands. <laughs> too deep. <laughs> My no. point is, the biggest thing, the, the going deep would be great. My point is, the thought that you need to is what's going to keep, keep you working it when you don't need to be. Your body does half. And it's like any triangle where you plug one side and the other side is plugged by your body or your thigh or their armpit. It's just a compression choke from every angle and absolutely going to sleep, right? You're feeling it. Yeah, every time. Every time. It's a fast tap. That's what's up, you guys. Let's all give a round of applause for Mike for joining the party right here. Thank yeah. you, brother. Appreciate everything. And uh, good details. Brian let's get Brian is our live studio audience and Jay and Evandro. Questions. Let's go more questions, you guys. So, he... He's asking like the he's he's mentioning that Hickson is big on breathing properly while rolling, and he's asking you guys uh, if you guys have any technique or any exercise. Yeah, I have the I know the most rolling. important technique for breathing while rolling. The number one sure. most important. Don't stop. Breathe. Just breathe. <laughs> is breathing, right? <laughs> that is the most <laughs> important one. The, the thing is this: literally, everyone. Hey, we got some business. We're just simply um, breathing is the most important. Because, yeah, the reality is Hickson's, Hickson's uh, diaphragmic breathing during the roll, it's gonna take you a while to figure it out. But what you need to remember if you're newer in the game is if you're not, because your mind is so consumed with other situations and grapple and holds and passing and doing, that the time to just literally stop at various points during the roll, those checkpoints, and hear yourself breathing out loud is so important that you actually get it done. Otherwise, you're always in that tense state, which is unacceptable. Next question. Do uh, not stop, you guys, no matter what. Gracie Jiu Jitsu Winnipeg is asking if uh, Ed Gracie had a favorite submission when he used to train with you guys. Well, it wasn't so much even with us. Ed Gracie is known for the Ed Gracie cross choke, the one he caught Kato in um, before he fought Kimura. That simple two on. His hands were the fastest hands to this day uh, in terms of the cross choke entry. That's a fact. I was actually with uh, Pat Hardy. Mm. You know Pat Hardy. From Uncle Texas. Pat. Uncle Been Pat. He's probably watching right now. Yeah, and Pat Hardy actually said, "You know, your grandfather had the fastest hands I've ever seen in my life." And then That's I it. saw your hands, and he said mine were faster. <laughs> I, I feel like he's saying that because you know, whoever is your hands you're looking at, they seem well, fast. Whoever's hands are around your neck but, feel the fastest. Correct. But the truth is, the fastest hands are the hands that have had the most shots. Yeah. And I don't have the fastest hands yet, but I'm working on it. Mine so, are very fast. And interesting, and because mine are not as fast as my grandfather's, I, we came up with, and I mean, we practiced and we utilized, lay down with your head towards them. We came up with a modification on the shot. Here's what I do. My, yeah, so, well, not a but here's the deal. My grandfather would loosen you up. He would, my grandfather, when he mounted on you, he would loosen up your gi, and he would go like this, just to say, hey, man, you're kind of hot. He'd go, boom, and he would shoot straight in right there and just lock him straight in, or just go, boom, and just shoot straight in. So he was very much about, like, do this, and you were supposed to let him do that. Anyways, so the hand goes in. He would be very fast. Like, he would just be like, boom. Huh? Yeah, our dad did that. Our dad, our grandpa, grandpa, all of, everyone loved it. Everyone loved it. Boom, boom. The second hand goes in. Once it locks in, your head goes down and you finish. The problem is, if you're not ridiculously fast, or if he does a decent job defending the hand as you come under, he'll grab onto your hand right here and they'll mess you up. So the shot under is always blocked by his secondary hand. So what I do is I think like I want that. He blocks it, he blocks it, and then watch. We go, boom, we trap it. Now block your neck. Can't. And we go down over the top. So this is the best one two punch here, you guys. <laughs> so I come under, grab my hand, grab my hand. Boom, look, as I grab, I grab his hand, look. I pull it down, I knee pinch, I rip my hand out, I shoot over, straight arm. Now he only has the wrong hand to defend, trying to push my hand off, stuck. And now I shoot my knee down, hooks go in, pressure and go. <laughs> Anyways, that's all great, but don't, again, you have to practice the speed. Yes. What was the question about the favorite move of our grandfather, right? Yes. His hand, he, he just did it a lot. You have to practice chokes. Guard. You have to lay down your back. Guard mount. You have to practice 
being fast. You don't just get there. And oftentimes, you know, you, you do it a few times and you jam your finger up and you don't get anything. Oh, it's so difficult. But that's because you're giving up on it. You have just, just, for example, like defend your neck, like how most people defend. Most people don't defend correctly. They don't block the second hand. Most people kind of just cover up. So my hand goes into small tricks like, you know, lifting your arm to make space for hand number two. Making a point that this hand is not in your uh, line of sight. I can't see it. You can't see it. Interesting. You know, these are small things or uh, also waiting for the right time, not having your hand on the ground and then removing it to attack. He knows, yeah. Having it already kind of back here. If you put your hand down, the lifting of your hand is too obvious. Right. Um, if you do you defend your neck. Now, go to roll me out now. What is the risk of putting a hand in the collar? Trap and yes. roll. Boom, my hand is in. Boom. So knowing the timing as to when to shoot your hand. So these are things that will help you become faster. And also, last one too, is my hand. Yes. That's why I don't like rash guards and t-shirts. But my hand, oftentimes, it takes this form. So that my, there's no way that I'm gonna jam my finger on somebody's shirt or on their skin. So it kind of, my hand skips off the person's chest. It slides in, what, it's in. So there's somewhat of a punch that exists. And when you do that, you might feel like, oh, you're being disrespectful, or you're being a, a hard training partner, but it's not the case. Nobody complains when I do that. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so knowing how to punch it and, and not being too concerned with, you know, having a little punch or hit on the entry. Talk to us, Jay. For top, who wants to know the, and not only for top, but there's many people here who want to know a little bit more about Eddie Gracie and how he was like in, in the house, in training, about his personality. So, so, what would you say, Hiro? I would say that there are many Eddie Gracies, and I've yeah. heard this many times that we knew one Eddie Gracie, right? Somebody who lives 90 plus years. Right? Imagine him, 27 years old, 35 right. years old, right. 45 years old, 65 years old. We only met him, right? He's in his 80s and we're kids, you know, 9 years old, 12 years old. So the Ellie Gracie that we knew is the Ellie Gracie that loves to help anybody do anything just as a person. If he sees you, you know, carrying bricks, unloading stuff from a car, you know what I mean? If he sees you doing laundry, let me help you fold your laundry. He's always on the move, always helping. And that's why I think we're so helpful. Kids, yeah. He would be, it's service. It's we're, service. And our father was the same way. You know, if it's your job, but it doesn't matter. I'm not doing anything. I might as well help you. So when, he, when, he, stayed at, when he stayed at our house, he would often come to America. And one of the most, one of the fondest memories I have of him uh, has nothing to do with jujitsu. It's just us hanging out at the house. And he would come to you the night before while he's playing his solitaire on the table, mm -hmm. right? He's, he loves solitaire. He would play for hours and hours. And I'm like, yeah, you can never get enough of that. When he's not helping someone, he's playing solitaire, like just pop, 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 pop. And I'm like, Grandpa, why so much? He's like, well, as long as I can play this and beat this and be successful at this game, I'm going to be, my, my mind is going to stay sharp. So he was just literally sharpening the sword the whole time, always doing something versus just blank stare, doing nothing. And so he's playing solitaire late at night. And then I say, okay, grandpa, I'm going to bed. And he would say, okay, Hannah, what do you want for tomorrow? Smoothie. What smoothie do you want? Well, how many bananas? Mm -hmm. What melon do you want? And how much do you want? And what time do you want it at? Because he knew as he got older, I think he slept less, which is not uncommon. Whereas you get older, you, get, you sleep a little less, you wake up earlier. So he would wake up at seven and I'm trying to sleep in until eight. And he's up at seven, 7.30 on the dot starting your smoothies. So by the time you wake up, you have your two full cups there, 100% ready to go. And the kitchen isn't a mess. It's cleaned already after the smoothies were already made. And yeah. this, the level of pride that he took in serving someone else, of course, the love he had for his family was just uh, you know, unprecedented. But, but something as simple as that, to be the one, the provider, and so, of course, so health conscious that I got that from our father and I also got it from our grandfather, this love for taking care of our health and, and that's something that I've always seen in the Gracie family. They're never not down to help someone, but more importantly, they're never not down to make the juice or get the vegetable juice or make the healthy food for the younger cubs yeah, in the pack. I guess it makes sense. If we're promoting a healthy lifestyle, right, we have to be willing to put in the hard work that it takes to live and enjoy the healthy lifestyle. Right. Right. And, you know, Imagine if I told you, yeah, you should eat only the, these juices and healthy foods and cook your meals right. and eat at home, but I'm not willing to cook for you or spend yeah. time at my own no. house. They, 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 that's that's all the, that's what, and that's the other thing. They walk work. the walk. They, they, they walk the walk and 
You know, our grandfather was one who said what he mean and mean what he said. And from, as a teacher, what was very interesting about our grandfather is that everyone, especially those who never had a chance to meet him, they, they, he's an iconic, almost like jujitsu god-like figure, and they place him on this pedestal. Now what's crazy is that he was aware of the pedestal that he was placed on, but he didn't agree with it into every sense. Mm -hmm. He knew that he was absolutely a normal person with an, with an extra, uh, with, a, with an ex exceptional skill that he knew could change lives. And he somewhat feared the position of, 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 of you know, idolization, I guess, that people would put him in and, and, and position him on because he felt that it might limit his ability to connect and to teach people. So our grandfather's the one who taught us to go out of our way and he did this in the best of everyone. When someone comes into the academy, and is very timid or very scared um, to be able to go onto their level and to become them and to, to speak with an intimidated man or woman or child in a way that they do not feel inferior, they do not feel intimidated. Hey champ, we're so glad to have you here. We're gonna have so much fun today. Just make sure you don't beat me up too much. Go easy on me. And to be able to lay low and get on their level in this situation is something that, yeah. that he really exemplified and versus the customary martial arts, which is everyone line up. Bow to your master. I'm the man. You're not. This idea that, no, we are in this together. I have a little more experience. I'm going to guide you. But at the end of the day, you know, I modified the techniques that I learned to make them what they are today. And we're here to grow. And I'm going to teach you everything I know. But we're going to continue growing together yeah. and, uh, and into the future. And, and he modified, but jujitsu did amazing things for him. Right. It did amazing things for him. So he, his whole mission was to give that to others. That's it. And what better way to do it than make yourself very, very available yeah. to everybody. That's it. And if life is measured by the quality of life that we instill into others, he was the richest guy I've ever met. Next question. Matalar Gomez asks, how do you finish a Darce choke when your arms can't go all the way through? The shallow Dars. Let's talk about it real quick. Did, he, did Henner ask you to ask that? <laughs> <laughs> Only because I'm on this hype right now, you guys. Everything has changed for me. So we're here in side mount. And I'm just at this place where it's just so relaxed, whether it's here, whether it's switching sides, letting the guy come up. I'm just maintain, maintain. Every time he don't turn on his side, he's already done. He's already done the fight's over. I'm not going to show the move. It's already over. <laughs> you come back. So look, when someone turns on their side, we're going to tie the rope. Boom. Head and arm. So right now, I've locked my arm around his neck. I'm grabbing my own palm right here. Guillotine grip, right? Standard guillotine grip. So I always tie the rope first. Once I get this guillotine grip right here, now I take the entire unit and I run the rope through. Look, punching through, putting the unit behind his head. He's gonna try to open his head and look up, look, to make sure to defend my bicep grab. But the problem is, these grips right here, once they're maintaining the lock, as he pulls his head away, pull away. We're gonna crank his neck down at the crown of his head, folding that bend in right there. Now, this is where everyone messes up. If from here, you shoot all the way to the bicep, a lot of times against bigger guys with shorter arms on yourself, you're like barely locking it up so as you're squeezing, it hurts your hand or your wrist. So as after the fold, here's what we wanna do. Look, the shallowest grab on our forearm, look. That's all you need right there. Basically wrist, forearm area. Grab his back, my elbow's right on top of the head, and my chest is on his arm right here. And then immediately on your toes, walk, 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 mount. And then take his top leg, hooking just his top leg here with just one leg, and then keep that, drop your hips, elbow comes in, chest goes down, and I roll my body, lifting this blade right into his artery. So the shallow dars is not only amazing because it allows you to lock up on a bigger guy with shorter arms, if you have shorter arms. The other reason why it's amazing is because, come here, sometimes people do dars chokes and they have more crank than choke. And the way I explain it is this. Guidon's neck is here, my blade is here. If my elbow is below my wrist, it's gonna be a neck crank. If my wrist is below my elbow, meaning my elbow's above my wrist, it's gonna be a choke because it's on his artery. Which it was. Yeah, that was a choke. So let me just show this. If, I, if your arm is in here, and I get my elbow very low and my hand facing up, and I grab my bicep, right now it's a neck crank. It's hurting his neck. He'll tap, but it's gonna just tweak his neck pretty badly. But watch this. When you go shallow dars, you do this. Boom, and you slide from here to down there, which means the blade of your elbow goes up into his artery. It's a perfect V. It's a perfect cutter right across his artery, and that is only possible with the shallow dars. So yes, indirectly I'm saying the shallow dars, besides being more accommodating for people with short arms, the shallow dars actually gets the choke more quickly and more consistently than the deep dars does. Now, if a long person arm does the dars on a skinny neck, like if I were to do it on my own neck, I could do a deep dars and still get some chokage in it. 
But a shallow Dars allows more choke if you have shorter arms on a bigger neck. That's the fact. It's interesting. I didn't realize that at first until now, I started using it a whole bunch. Now it does. Now the important, I guess the main thing that I'm taking right here is that you don't want to shoot the Dars. You shoot the... The, the tie the rope. You shoot the guillotine Boom. first. And then I tie it second. Yes. Yeah, and, and why? Why not shoot the darts? Is it because it's not it's too obvious? Well, yeah, so people are very much it's very hard to get your armpit to cooperate. If you're side mount and I do this, you're this, gonna defend right now. My, yes. He's gonna defend. And now my hands are separated, so I'm trying. So instead, I don't try to go like because here's the deal. I have to get all the way to here at some point. Yep. If this guy has to travel hundred percent by himself, yeah. you can stop him. But if I meet in the middle, 50-50, now they've met. Now resist a little bit. Yeah. Now I'm chilling right here, but I've already met my hands. And when you soften up, I do the other 50% united. So this hand it comes has, in and gets them. It's somewhat reserved the space. Yes. It's keeping the space reserved and, you run the and rope. it's connected and you pull it through. You're pulling the rope straight through, you guys. That's the bottom line. Okay, so next question. Shallow darts. Next question, next question. Can Ryan ask, uh, can you demonstrate an escape from body triangle? Body triangle. Yeah, we talked about it uh, many times. Many times. There's different fights. Um, Brian Ortega's breakdown when you fought, um, I think the first one, body triangle from the back. Body triangle. The first fight. What was it, the guy's name? Mike Delatore. Delatore. I think you body triangled him or, or he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you did, right? And we, he stood up. Yeah, he stood up and you were on his back. So we talked about body triangles. Brian fought Mike Delatore. So here's the bottom line. Number one, fall towards the triangle. Number one. Because he don't always want to have the triangle on the top side. So he don't get your over under, however. Yeah, so he's here. If we're on this side, he don't want it on the top side. So what I want to do is I want to push up and I want to cross over to where we land on the body triangle side. Now he's going to want to switch his body triangle, fast switch. He's going to want to do that. Go back. You don't want to permit that. So if he tries to switch, your leg has to be here. Okay? If he gets his leg out, there's no way I'm going to permit his leg to switch. Number one, go back. Well, let's say he has it, he's not letting go. You're falling towards the body triangle side. Keep it tighter. Look, we're gonna take our leg and we're gonna get it flat on the ground, like an elbow escape from the mount. Once we get that, we're just keep working here, we we'll keep working here. Now I'm gonna bring my foot in here and get my foot under his, look. So it's almost like a little fish hook. Now I'm gonna be working the hands right here, little by little peeling, putting a frame in on his neck. Okay, and at this point here, I'm gonna start walking it up. One, two, three, four, five, I slip it. So I'm out of the choke, but I'm still trapped in the body triangle. Now all I need to do now is the foot that I had hooked, I need to grab it. Try to pull me back. Yeah. No, I put my elbow between our bodies. Yeah, so, he, his grab is way too strong. On the foot. Yeah, the grab. Yeah. Because your arm is straight. Too right, much so you're here. Once I do this and I do my little fish hook, I slip this. The foot's right there. Try to stop me from grabbing the foot. It's hard. Yeah. You don't have, because I'm not inside his arms anymore. Yeah. So legs first, arm second, leg third, and then elbow fourth. Yeah, once he grabs and my leg is straight, my triangle is weak. So when his body turns, my foot pops free. Yeah, and I'm gonna, even if I turn inside the triangle, I'm good. Yeah, th and this is so similar to what we showed with Brian when Brian had my neck. It's just yes. untying the legs. Untie the knot. So it's the rear naked choke, the triangle, they're all the same. The, tri the triangle and the rear naked choke are the same thing. They're the same. It's arms and legs. Other questions? Yes, Todd is asking how does he don't apply the side control that makes you feel like you're being squeezed by a giant anaconda? Just tap out. Yeah, what's funny is he's just a heavy guy. 191. It's funny because he doesn't feel 191. He feels 391, you guys. Dang, I don't know. Tito, can you, can you teach that? Is that teachable? Your Pass. side mount? Pass. Next question. No, so side mount control. <laughs> yeah, I think my side mount control, okay, I put some weight. But I think that more than the weight that I put, it's, I guess it's the stress, the pressure that you put on, on yourself out. to get out. Yeah. So if I can control somebody for a minute, a minute and a half, or if someone tries to escape the side mount for a minute and a half and fails. That's interesting. What state are they going to be in? That's a great point. They're going to be, they're, they're, they're ready to tap even by themselves. Like they've already tapped themselves. That's I'm just the icing point. on the cake. That's a great so point. So I allow people, sometimes when you control the side mount, I can be very close and very tight and not give you any space. You don't do that that often. I like to be a little bit loose almost. Like a little bit like oh semi on you. So I'm like, I'm, it's almost like you're almost getting out all the time. Interesting. If you're almost getting out all the time, that means that you're never gonna stop working. It's so crazy. I want I want to keep the carrot so close That's to you. So crazy. That you'll always keep fine. running. If the carrot is like 50 feet away, you'll say, ah, it's not possible. It's not possible. But as long as you believe it's possible, you'll keep trying, trying, trying. So I want to milk you for all that you have. That's so interesting. Once you give me a whole minute and a half, or sometimes 30 seconds, then I lay my weight. 
Interesting. And no one's and then gonna they feel heavier now yeah, because they're exhausted. It's not that much weight. He feels 191. I right now I feel 191 yeah. to you. And then I bring my arms underneath. I do a little where I hold and I just pull. Oh, 391. Do you feel heavier? Yes. Because I'm 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 anchoring myself to you. That's good. It would almost be the equivalent of if it had like a little handle on the ground right here. Right. But I don't have the ground. I have to use you. So that is true. And then of course where you place yourself. If you're too high on the body, how does it feel? Not so it's bad. not the same as here. Yeah, the diaphragm. Here. So I'm a little bit lower near the floating ribs. It's the kind of thing that you only learn with time and asking this person. But know that it starts with this person's desire to escape. Well, how, that's a great question here. But not true, because like, even if not you try to stay, if it, when I stay still, you, you, you still feel heavy? Though. So it's like, no, you, you don't submit still. what? From the pressure? Because, you know, like you said, you keep the care. So, like, I've tried it where I've tried, like, all right, and I'm like, I got cardio, so I don't care how long that car is there for. I'm gonna escape for like five right. minutes. And then I was like, all right, and I still can't escape, and I just lean back and say, maybe if I just chill. Then what happens? I'm just gonna relax, and I'm gonna try to find like the right time to escape. And you still, get, and you still get caught. Well, remember, but, but you were still fighting no, before no, no. we got there. I, I know. I, Other I, positions. No, no, but th that's like one experience. And then my next experience, I like, okay, I have a little, like a little training camp for you. I'm like, <laughs> next time I go, I'm just gonna chill. And then when he makes a mistake, I'm gonna escape. So what you're saying is that but if the you're way on top, you're not escaping. It's just, just not happening. It's just not happening. I don't care if you push or you don't push. You're not escaping. It's just a matter the of bottom when person. you get submitted. Yeah. That's true. Oh, when, yes. when with heat on, you're not escaping. That's the bottom yeah, line. Yeah. yeah. There's no anti heat on seminar to see DVD series. Well, like just, I'm, like, I'm trying to learn right now. You gotta train with me more, bro. <laughs> but just, you're in the private room, bro. Don't. But and also, it's <laughs> it's also um, it takes getting used to. Yes. Right? Because it's the same thing that goes for like, you know, somebody laying their gi or their body in your face. There are certain uncomfortable things that we experience and that we think they are worse than they actually are. Yeah, especially when you're so there. So you're not gonna, if, let's say I've tapped 150 people in the last year from side mount pressure. If they tapped out and I didn't stop, they wouldn't pass out. Right. They their, their ribs wouldn't break. They wouldn't die. Nothing would happen. But it's uncomfortable though. It's uncomfortable. So it's 80% uh, of it is in your mind. It's getting comfortable. Let me ask you guys a question real quick on the side. How does he, how does he feel so heavy? Does he don't feel heavy or are you, does your inability to get out make him feel heavier than he actually is? Of course. Look at my belt right here. How heavy is my belt would you say? Actual weight? Uh, a pound? Yeah. The pound. Let's say the belt weighs one pound. Okay. But let me ask you, when I grab my belt, I try to bench press it. and. Let's say my max is 200 pounds bench press. How heavy is my belt now? If I can move it, my belt is now 200 pounds. And if my max bench press is 400 pounds and I can't bench press it, my belt is now 400 pounds. So he don't does not change his weight. He don't is just heavier based on the desperation you are creating by trying to get out. So the moral of the story is his carry at the end of the stick was the most valuable thing he said. He's saying that he wants you to keep trying to get out to the death by making it somewhat seem impossible for you to get out, and that's where you get yourself in the deeper hole, because you believe it's possible, and you fight, 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 and then he feels heavier, because the belt's still not moving, and you're trying your hardest, because you believe it's bench pressable, when the belt is not bench pressable, because it's stuck to you. Next question. Todd Tanaka and Andrew Yu, uh, independently, both asked, how do you escape the bow and arrow choke? Dang, deep. Anytime you ask how to escape a submission, our immediate response, Todd, is, why are you how, caught in that submission? It's how do you prevent it? How do you prevent it? Yeah, That's the real question. It's, you guys, think about Andrew Gracie. How would Andrew Gracie respond to all of these? How do you escape he'd, them? He'd be disappointed in you guys, to be honest. He'd be disappointed in you even getting, you know, 50% there. <laughs> no, but Todd, he would not be disappointed in you because, you know. He'd be disappointed in Todd. No, no, he loves Todd. No, he did No. <laughs> Get on my back. He'd be disappointed <laughs> in me. Imagine Todd, anybody. Get on my back. Come on. Why are you asking that? Look at this. Hooks in, over, under. So boom. So here, the, yeah. Once this gets caught, it's pretty much a done deal. There's a reason why this move is used so commonly. Why did you have me on your back then? If it's a done deal. Well, I'm gonna go a little step phase further. I'm gonna go phase a, a second sooner. The defense is when the collar is grabbed on the lapel. Defense number one. Point your finger. He's pointing your where your body should go. So if he don't ever get a collar grip and we're on a back mount like this, what I want to do is put my back on the ground because that unravels the choke, right? Hold the lapel. As you turn this way, it gets tighter. Hold it. Yeah. It gets tighter. As you turn this way, it gets looser. Got now it. the problem is that is impeded by the fact that he has an underhook possibly. If he has an underhook, now I can't turn this way because he's holding it and he's getting tighter over here. So if it gets to the point where they have a grip on the lapel and you can't lay your back on the ground and spin all the way around. 
I'm gonna grab this look. And that's when I push across towards the choking side. Oh, choking. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I grab two hands on the sleeve of the arm that he's actually choking me with. And we fall to the choking side. Face the camera. Mm -hmm. And then from here, I hold the two sleeves. And then I, like, I use my legs. I drive myself south as he pulls pressure on the trigger. Get both knees and squeeze. And my head goes on the ground. Got because it. the one weakness of a, of, a, of a kind of a bow and arrow choke is when you push and you pull, there's a space in Hedon's armpit right here behind my head now that opens up when he arches. Now, if he's close with his chest, it doesn't open up. It stays kind of tight. But if I grab the lapel, the sleeve with two hands, and I'm, worst case scenario, as he begins to arch and pull this arm back, I use my feet, look, and I put my head on the ground. Now the choke is no longer in, and my head slips out from underneath. So rule number one, rotate with the choke. Spin and go in the direction of the unraveling of the choke. Step number two is once it's tight, double sleeve control, fall to the choke side, slide south, look north, yeah. and hope that it's open. But if it gets fully tight, like there's no slack in the rope, then there's nothing you're gonna do. You're gonna grab the pants, you have to break one of their grips to make it happen. And, uh, and that's kind of tough. Now one thing that I used to do when I was a kid in the desperation mode, I do the one with the leg grab. He don't hear, everything's locked in. Did earlier? Yes, the same thing, he's fully locked here. Look, it's fully like, everything is tight, hold tight, look, look, look. Because a tight rope, think about this, a tight rope, the tighter the rope, the easier the slice, if that makes sense, right? A loose rope, hold it real loose. Mm -hmm. it's, I can't break Hidon's grip because it's too loose. The minute he brings his knee in and he's pulling real tight, start stretching it. There's no slack. I get two hands. Tell me he's going to hold that grip on his fingertips when you go two on one. Am I right? Am I right? Very different. Tight and I go boom and I jack his fingers open right there. So the point is, that won't work though in the circumstances that I demonstrated earlier where the slack, where there was still looseness. So if it's loose, slip out, turn and face. If it's tight, no slipping because there's no space, but his grip is tight. So the question you always have to ask yourself is, when something is tight, something else is open or loose. When something is closed, another door opens. So when something is difficult, where is the easy, where is the weakness in their attack? Great question. Edwin Andrew, Omadan, asks, um, he says that Brian Ortega combined boxing with his jiu-jitsu. Does it mean that jiu-jitsu alone is not enough? Well, I'm just gonna dip this. Come over here, I can't hear you. I'm just in a different sport where where I feel like you you know you need to have all the tools. And, and the beginning the beginning process for me was that was when I seen guys who, you know, like some situations where a fighter or like a jiu-jitsu practitioner mainly can't take the opponent down and the person runs away and kind of just jabs a little bit and then scores points and then wins the fight by decision. Right. So my whole thing was what, how, I need to learn boxing, not only to, to know the game and to defend myself properly, but to create opportunities to use jiu-jitsu during those opportunities of, of, of like the chaotic, uh, you know, like, uh, like punching that takes place. Yeah, you said to frustrate, really, yeah. right? Just. You know, and, and I mean, how much boxing, you're, you're boxing to make them box back, to make them uncomfortable, to make them want to take you to the ground, and then you can use your jiu-jitsu. So it's you're very using simple, boxing. Yeah. And, and the question is too, is is punching jiu-jitsu, can you throw a, a one-two? Of course. Now, of course, now how extensive your boxing knowledge is, it can be more, but so learning boxing is 100% okay, and Eddie Gracie well, would agree. Yes. Now, if you're learning boxing because you want to go knock people out, that's where right. you know, you're running the risk of now knocking yourself out and you're winning by, you know, I guess, strikes, which is not wrong, but it's not as reliable as... Well, it's very simple, yeah. It's, it's just, the rules that of the, determine the game and the game determines the skill set. That's very simple. The rules for Brian that he's playing with, which is a very serious game he's playing, but it's a game, it's a sport nonetheless. The rules are you have judges watching and they're going to decide at the end of the round whether you win or lose based on the very specific criteria that they created. Now, those are not the same set of circumstances or, or external factors that you would experience if you're in a street fight. The only thing that matters if you get in a fight is that if you don't get knocked out and you go home at the end of the fight and you don't go to the hospital, you won. Manage the distance, manage the damage all the way in, all the way out. Now, to stand there toe-to-toe -to -toe for three rounds like Brian sometimes does in his fights because he has to because the guys are hard to take down. And to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in a street fight is a bad idea because you risk getting knocked out. And if you get knocked out in a street fight, you're, you risk dying. It's death. It's, it's not someone who's going to break it up and say, oh, let him go. Get him up. Let him up. Let him up. Yeah. And protect. It's not a referee and padded floors, you guys. This is not it. So playing the, the sport that he's playing um, is something that he absolutely has to know and he's done incredibly well with and, and strongly recommend it to anybody else who ventures in the same, in the same sport. 
Now, what can't be misconstrued or confused here is thinking that a new student who comes in to learn self-defense, right, right out the gate, and let's say it's a 40-year-old guy, has two kids, and, you know, he's a doctor, right, for lack of, you know, different analogies or comparisons or examples, and this guy wants to learn a self-defense system where he can protect himself, and he's going to get in a fight in six months. He should spend no time training boxing. He should, yeah, he should spend only boxing he should do is keeping the distance yes. to avoid getting hit. But if you tell that 40-year-old guy that, listen, when they throw the jab, I want you to slip the jab the way this guy does perfectly, slip and then come back over the top with the right and counter punch. If you tell that 40-year-old, you're actually harming him. You're not just not helping him. You're actually harming him because you're keeping him at the range where he is most likely to get knocked out. The problem is not in boxing itself. Boxing, like any other sport, has its great benefit. The problem is in the conviction that if you get into a fight against someone bigger than you, that that strategy of keeping that distance is a safe strategy for someone, especially with limited training. Now, if Brian gets in a street fight, having honed his craft as long as he had, he will slip the jab and knock the guy out and drop him and walk him. No, no, no. Tell us how it would go. I wouldn't get in a fight. That's better answer, bro. <laughs> If only it were true, if only it were true, bro. It's quiet. <laughs> no, but it's, it's anyway, no, no, more no, true than ever now. It is more true it than ever. True. But Brian you getting, avoided a fight recently. Remember the guy you bit your tongue? I'm just saying, yeah. Brian getting in a street fight, I mean, for free? Just fight someone and fall no, not after those, knee, not after those knee, fight of the night no bonuses, knee. bro. Not after those fight of the night bonuses. He's no fight you don't for free fight anymore. You do fight for free no more, bro. <laughs> you almost had one the other day, too. No, no, not almost. And you brought it down, right? It wasn't almost. You said it come down. It could have. It could have. It could have. Guys. But, but, you know, you just said to deflect the energy away. You, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Psychological. No, but the main thing we were talking about was you needed the foundation. The only reason I did what I did and learned boxing was because I had so many years of training jiu-jitsu and I already felt like I was good enough at it that I can start learning another art but never forget my initial art. Yeah, you know? to further your understanding, to keep yourself safe. To just do the same well, And look at the last fuck. And the best example is yeah. yeah. these guys in the UFC, oftentimes they don't really want to win. They don't really want to beat you up. They just want to win the game. They just want to win the round. But, yeah. So how they come at you is very intelligent. Very different than a now, team, yeah. strategic. And it's very. much different than UFC 2, for example, yes. UFC 3, because there was no time limit. You had to win or you so, lost. And, and the more they joke around, the more time passes, and the more energy they burn, the more risk that they get exhausted and they right. lose. So they have to win now. So when Hoyas is fighting guys that have to win to keep themselves safe, they have Those to beat Hoyas to keep themselves safe, Hoyas is able to do what? Not invest years and years in boxing right. and use only jiu-jitsu, which is more like a street fight would be. Yes. So that's why, once again, jiu-jitsu is the ultimate it art It all for depends on what you're doing, the game you're trying to play. Brian is doing his exceptionally well. His last fight was a great example. He couldn't take the guy down. He said, man, I had trouble taking the guy down. He's a smart jiu-jitsu guy as well. And he said, Henry, I just decided I had to put so much pressure with the punches that he had to shoot in. So Brian's boxing forced the guy to jump into his jiu-jitsu pool so he can do his jiu-jitsu. Like, that's how committed he was to choking this guy, that he was willing to get punched in the process because he couldn't get him down any other way. So it's beautiful. That's just the nature of this, this game that, we're, that I'm that's playing That's just now, the nature you know? of the game. And the street fight's not even going to be nowhere near as that. Nothing. And the first yes. punch that happens, Simpler. you're going to take the guy down, Boom. and that's it. Yeah, that's what's a up. street fight is so much more Scary. dangerous. So dangerous. Yeah. It's so much scarier. It's so Concrete much riskier. Rules. But yet it's so much easier. Yes. It depends. Right? No, hold on. Compared if you look at what you're Compared you to what did, you're dealing compared with. Compared to what you did in your last fight, you three five minute rounds, how much well, well, how I hard that was. I'm just saying him getting a street fight with the average person, twenty three year old kid in the street. It's it would more be a, dangerous. It would be a one-minute fight. It's but more, it's, there's more at risk, but it's easier. Tactically, it's easier for because we you guys didn't have the same schools. Yes. But, well, but circumstantially, gotta, it's more dangerous well, you because you don't, be gonna you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, you don't know. Fear of the bottle comes out of nowhere. Yeah. We know it's crazy. Like, guns, guns, That's why don't fight. Street. If there's ever a chance yeah. not to fight, don't fight. Don't fight. Yeah, and they, I, we know that some of you guys are there are new blues, especially you light blues. The light blues. What do they say to themselves? When you were light blue, what'd you say to yourself? I know. I tried. I, I want to go get down. I, I want to go. I, I want to go see what's up. You know what? When I was light blue, I was in high school, and I and I tested so it, it, and I knew it, it worked. Organic. I already knew it, it worked. Organic. I knew it worked. My sister had a, a boyfriend. Whatever, something happened, and then I was like, you know what? I'm gonna use jujitsu now. Like, this is having to test. Let me, let me test it out. See if it works. And I went in there. Yeah, I went in there. Boyfriend? Yeah, ex-boyfriend. Okay. Now, I went in there, I went in there and the guy punched, you know, like we we exchanged a couple punches, we exchanged two punches, and then I hit him. 
and he actually grabbed me and pulled me on top of him. Oh my gosh. So I didn't even have to do the takedown. <laughs> so then I was mounted and I was like, oh my God, Dr. Siki Jones. <laughs> and then he like tried to, he tried to escape and I was like, just easy, like too easy. hand side to side. It was too easy. And he put his hand up. I was like, no arm way. lock, put the arm lock. But he bit me though from the arm. <laughs> and you didn't snap his arm. No, I hammer fist. Better. Just to get him off because it hurt. I think he's grateful that you hammer fisted him. No, but I popped, I popped a little bit. You did just, both? A little no, stretch. No. Little stretch. After, after a little stretch, just to uh, uh, like remind him, you know, what I could do to you. Yes, what's up? Did you have yeah, a video? Was done. What's up, video? No, but I have a couple friends. It didn't happen. Anyways, anyway, we happen. know we know the light blues are thinking. No, he, know, he knows it happened. happened. He knows it happened. So I won't say his name, but he knows it happened. Listen, so the bottom line is don't test your jujitsu light blues. Go to class, train more. Your day will come. And when it comes, just say, hey, egos and alcohol. Take those two out of the equation. No need to fight. Trust me. Yeah. We don't fight for free, you guys. Yeah. Even if you don't fight in the UFC, you still don't fight for free. Well, it's, and the thing is, this is <laughs> am I right? Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> Unless you're going to fight like Mike Tyson. Then you fight for free. Then you fight for free. He don't or let Mike know, you guys. But Mike's no, older no, no. now. It's not. Don't, uh, don't Mike, make that tell me. Uh, but my Mike, point is that no. Mike's saying, the Mike Tyson, he's, everybody's the homie. Everybody's yeah, respect for yeah, yeah. But I'm saying, to fight Mike Tyson. For the, for the experience. Ryan would fight Mike for Tyson the for free. Got it. And that's Eddie Gracie tying both hands. I, <laughs> I don't know if I would. Next question. No, hold on. Be Before afraid. one thing, you said it. I want to get paid for that. Think about what's the street fight you wouldn't walk away from, right? What is the verbal confrontation? What would you not walk away from? <laughs> It's a good question. Well, no, the only one is a physical on assault. A physical assault. So somebody attacks physical you cannot assault. walk away. You're stuck in the elevator. Yeah. So or you can or you can like or you can like find a way to push them off balance and run away. You Correct. So if somebody attacks you. Violent you can't physical walk away. assault is the only situation where you so would not walk away. So if somebody throws a cheeseburger at your wife, you are we're fighting. We're fighting. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? You understand? Are you no, that's fighting? Ego. That's ego. That's ego. ego. You said to take ego. Well, no, no, the truth is, way. or we grab the burger and just nom nom nom. But yeah, no, I don't eat cheeseburgers anymore. Mercy diet. No eat cheeseburgers. <laughs> In and out. No one no. knows. <laughs> so, but back to the point, though. Did you understand? If somebody calls your child, yes. If they calls your listen, child, they get it. You know, the they game. Get it. Anything you can walk away from, you walk away. Now, if they're attacking or endanger anyone, you have to do something. You do it. They get it. They're a very well, no, intelligent. No, they audience. don't get it. We have the, the most intelligent audience on Facebook. No, what they believe is that if somebody disrespects you, they you have to prove them. You have to prove it to attack. You have to well, defend their honor. Well, that means that you're small in size. No, 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 no. It means, I, I feel it, feel it means it. that you don't have a lot of confidence. I had that recently. I'm just saying. Yeah, verbal, verbal. You walk away. Physical. Boom. Now, here's the deal. Here's the end of the day. If your confidence is so deficient, let's say your bank account is almost like net zero, zero balance in your bank account, and someone makes a withdrawal, says, hey, calls your wife something or disrespects you or your wife, then you go into the red. And when you're in the red and the confidence, you do stupid things like get into fights for no reason. What we propose is that through jujitsu and other healthy habits, or through fighting the UFC, or through being a good person in your life and connecting in a positive way, you make so many deposits of confidence into your bank account, and by helping other people, nothing is more confident inducing than helping other people. Teaching, serving, connecting, being there for your friends, nothing gives confidence more than being there for people. So we make so many deposits in our own bank account so often of helping people and serving the world and building our confidence through training jiu-jitsu that we live up here in the bank account. So if someone says something, I might be like, man, he really shot my confidence by doing that, but I'm still in this area. I'm not in the red yet, so you're not gonna get me to fight for free for that comment. It's not enough. I'm too high. Yeah, now what's true. interesting true. is this is the same for children. It's a good example, because adults are just grown up children. Children often go to school and they have made fun of, and the problem is, if a children's bank account is very low, when they get made fun of, they go into the red and they do crazy things, right? I mean, the exaggerated cases are youth suicide and school shootings, many of which stem from bullying. This drugs, is drugs, alcohol. alcohol. It all stems, in many cases, from bullying. And the question is, how do you avoid that? Well, the answer is, if, you're, if the, your child's confidence is primarily composed of deposits made by their peers, then the withdrawals can also be made by their peers. So what's the secret? You have to find ways to make deposits for your child's bank account of confidence that are not controlled by their peers. And jujitsu for a child, there's nothing better because it's a regular influx of confidence deposits and it builds their bank account. So when they get a withdrawal at school, it doesn't take them into the red. Yes. The problem is most kids don't have outside of peers 
uh, contribution or, 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 or deposit met opportunities, and they're always in the red. And just and just the overall home. Take it sometimes. My kid's a champ. Your kid is a super champ every yeah. time. And just the overall home environment. That's the environment. Right? Just the, the environment that we grew up in at home. Just parents that actually <laughs> listen to their children and speak to their children, right? And put the phone down and connect with them. Their children feel like they feel safe. Right. They have a, they have a safe haven. Okay. Come. Last question. Yeah. People, people want to know uh, your thoughts on heel hooks. And how, how well you should train, and so you can share one or the other. Yeah. You know, one or other. Well, so yeah, so heel hooks are interesting, and they're incredibly effective, and we think they're amazing. They got to be trained safely, and with the heel hook, we say that they shouldn't have to. Even if my partner doesn't tap, there should be no snap. If I catch a heel hook on someone and we're rolling, and they don't tap, or they don't think to tap, or they don't, their ego won't let them tap, I still won't snap the heel hook. And you should not be able to. You should not use heel hooks unless you understand that. And. I have a question for us, I guess, is, you know, when it comes to training heel hooks and toe holds and, you know, all these different leg locks and knee bars, you know, how much time should somebody spend on those and, and, and I guess, sacrifice time on positional control, <laughs> right? Right, escaping inferior positions, right. blocking punches, because it can really consume a lot of your time, right? And if you're a blue belt with one or two strikes or two years in the game, a year and a half, and you become fascinated with leg locks, you know. And you're catching people. Bum, 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 and you're catching you people. Kind of, you, sometimes you don't develop in other areas because you become so, which leg locks are very, if you're good at them, because a lot of people are not good at them. So yeah. if you become good, like I was when I was 15, 16, it was one of my main go-tos, and I would catch all these purple, brown, and black belts even though I was only a blue belt. So it became my little handicap, like I'm gonna do this, I can catch anyone. I didn't care how I got the taps, I'll just take what I can get. <laughs> And that's the biggest problem with leg locks. If you become good at them, sometimes you become over reliant on them, and you don't really you don't really develop you're, in other areas. You almost, and I'm not that leg lock specialist. Yeah, but you're I, good at I them. I feel like I'm very good at them. Yes, but, and I can get some random black belts and leg locks and surprise them. But you almost live in a world of your own. Yes. When you're everything leg locks, and yes. there are guys out there today that are winning amazing tournaments, and they're leg lock yes. grandmasters. Yes. And all the respect to them, but. You might not be them. Yes. You might not be them, and and just uh, I just wonder as to, as to a leg lock grandmaster that might even beat ten people in ten tournaments in leg locks. Yes. Or somebody that is a master and just in, I don't want to say a master in everything, but so solid all around, well rounded. Right. Right. It's just if you can choose, yeah. And at the end of the day, that's where we try to be, you guys. You want to be. You want to be. Um, you you want to you want to speak all languages. That's the bottom line. You cannot. We do not recommend you develop the leg locks or you develop yourself in triangles yeah. only. And my dad said it to me when I was very young and it stuck forever and it's the advice I'll give you on this topic. I was a master at like ankle locks, mainly ankle, I wasn't doing that many heels, but ankle locks and toe holds I was yeah. doing when I was much younger, catching everybody. And it was so easy that it was like guaranteed I was gonna get you. At that point, my dad said, Henry, you're like a hand with a thumb. Great, stop using your thumb and start developing your other fingers, triangles, arm locks, chokes, back mount, mount, whatever else it is, develop your other you know, limbs, appendages, and opportunities and attack systems so that eventually you have a full functioning hand and two hands that you can attack from every angle. And that's what you want to be. Learn them, speak the language, learn how to defend against them. And we, we recommend exploring and understanding everything, but never get too stuck in one area, even if you're good at it, because then you, you limit your development in other areas oftentimes. The only place you can get stuck, if you're going to get stuck anywhere, yes. you're going to get stuck in avoiding getting knocked out and avoiding getting submitted. Yeah, that's the only obsession that is 100% yes. okay is become the frustration nation master of your academy. Nobody beats From you. From every position, you are obsessed with avoiding because and putting your defense before your offense. This ability, it will serve you far and way throughout your whole jiu-jitsu journey. Serve you in the early years, You're gonna be serve you in your prime, and it'll serve you forever. in your after prime. Listen. In your jiu-jitsu retirement, it'll serve you the most. It's everything. And he don't says the best. He don't says, don't wait till you're 60 to start training like you're 60. Because you're gonna be 60 one day, if you're not already there. If you are there, you're my idol. If you're gonna be 60 one day, if you're not there. He don't says, well, if you start, if you wait till you're 60 to start rolling like your body is 60, you're gonna be a white belt at being 60 years old. But if you start training 20 years ago, right, at 30 or 40 years old, every single once a week you train like you're 60, by the time you get 60, you've been 20 years rolling like you're 60. Not every day of the week. I'm just saying once a week, twice a week. Yes. And when you or one round per 30 minute session. 
And when you roll like you're 60 for 20 years, you're going to be a black belt at being 60 on the mat. And the number one reason people quit is they fail to meet their expectations because their body gets older while their expectations remain the same. So the secret is, you guys, train like you're 60, invest in that belt right now. 100%. Last question. Uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu. Uh, Three more. Ching Dao Three asks, more. Did she know? Uh, she <laughs> Dao. Yeah, did Richard. Elio, did Elio, um train Nogi? What was his opinion on uh, challenge matches taking place in Gi or Nogi? Xingdao, China. We have a CTC in China, you guys. Uh, it's so beautiful there, you guys. It's such an amazing place. Um, so regarding Eddie Gracie and Nogi, um, because the Gi was not as overutilized Whoa. of a tool as it is today, today, training Gi means taking this lapel, wrapping it under your legs, around the shin, over the wrist, and through the neck, and then kicking the other leg and sweeping someone with it, because that wasn't the case, it literally was just there and was grabbed occasionally and was not grabbed a lot of the time. It was the gi no gi obsession didn't exist as it did back then. You just you got good at jujitsu and they wore the gi well, primarily. Okay. But however, he fought many times without the gi and he would train many times. You see pictures of our grandfather on a farm with the farmhand, some big tough guy who works there at the at the property, and it's like both of them in shorts and nothing and rolling on the hard dirt in the farm. So him, he didn't think of jujitsu as being a gi or no gi thing. Jiu-Jitsu was just a, a, a martial art, and the gi was the uniform they used to practice it, but it was never differentiated, and the effectiveness well, was never affected by that. And, and he might have wore a gi, you know, <laughs> very often, but he did many fights with people who wore no gi. Right. And I don't even know, I don't think he had to even change his training regimen. Right. Like today, people are like, oh, I have a gi tournament happening in two months. Right. I can't wear no gi right. one day and waste a day. But for him, he didn't wear a gi, no gi for you know, three months straight before a fight, and it's no problem, it's all the same because he's not reliant on the gi. Right. And I think we should end on, you know, we should do a couple, two more questions. Okay, two more questions, then we have to do the wrap up. Yeah, um, you know, it's been a pretty long time. People wanna know how to become a CTC. You can touch that from the other Yeah, thing. so the process of becoming a CTC, um, the briefest version possible is go to gracieuniversity.com. Gracieinstructor.com? Gracieinstructor.com is um, is one that has a lot of information. The other one is gracieuniversity.com slash territory reservation. And uh, yeah, gracieugu.com slash territory reservation. We have an amazing process in place where if you have a martial arts school and you're pondering and becoming a CTC, what you do is you get to reserve the territory that you're in and then while you're learning the Gracie Combatives curriculum, Gracie Bullyproof to become a level one CTC, you go through the processes that will allow you to become a CTC while the territory remains unreserved. Because the worst thing, and it's happened before we had this system in place, is someone goes through all the hoops only to find out that their territory has already been taken by someone else who got in before they even realized it and they put all the effort in to become certified and now they can't. So that'll give you the most information. We're not gonna explain what the process yeah. is like, but just know this, at the core of everything CTC is the Gracie Combatives program because we need to be able to go out public videos like this and be able to say, yo, to the world, if you go to any CTC, it's the exact same curriculum. And that begins with Gracie Combatives and Gracie Bullyproof and the teaching methodologies, the energy, the vibe, all of that is consistent at every CTC, but it begins with the ICP, Instructor Certification Process, that you will learn more about at gracieinstructor.com, for sure. Do you guys have any information on the new academy? Everyone wants to new know. academy! Hmm. We're about uh, a week or two out from moving into the new academy. Um, you guys will be the first to know. Trust me, there will be videos, there will be pictures, mm -hmm. there will be connections, but more, there will be invitations for you guys oh. to come out and hang out. Yeah, I mean, all you have to know is that you want to come. Many people haven't even been to the academy on Artesia. Yeah, that's true. That we're at right now. Many of you have been following us for seven, eight years. And yeah, I want to go to Torrance. I want to go to Listen, Torrance. You guys, and they're for some reason, people don't do it. I don't know why. Listen, you, well, people have lives. It's people true. have jobs and families, and it costs money and it takes time. And we know you want to do it. But let me tell you one thing right now. This is the school you want to come to. Yeah, this is designed this for is you guys. It. I mean, just everything that every challenge, every problem we had over the last, you know, uh, 10, 15, 20 years, we tried to address in the in the new development of this school and in the construction of this school to where it makes the optimum service for students from all over the world. But come visit us. If you live anywhere else in the world, you guys, come visit us after the next, like I said, we'll announce once we're in over there. But once we are at the new location, make the field trip. We're very used to it. Some people think they're gonna come to the school and be alienated or be treated differently because well, they're from, not from there or they're coming from somewhere else. You guys have no idea. We, the, the academy is so used to having visitors that when someone comes up from China or South Africa or Singapore or wherever or Texas and they show up and want to train, Which, we're very used to that. It's a very natural process and we love it the most. Yeah, I've actually, there's 
there are a few schools that are figuring out that when someone comes to visit your school, that basically tapping them out 20, 30, 40 times is not the way to treat them. Yes. If someone comes and visits us from Italy or from Texas, I want them to consider moving to Torrance right. after the experience. That's how at important the, at the our experience. Academy. That's how careful we are to make that experience positive it, for people who visit. It's 2017. If you come here, we want you to feel very welcome. And many schools are doing this now. And we've had students of ours that have traveled the world and yes. have gone to schools that are not certified training centers and have been very welcome. So it's it's the way of the future. Is when someone comes to visit you and they're wearing a gi and they want to do jujitsu, it's all one team. Even if you're not a certified training center and you come to visit, yes. it's all one team. You know what we call this? I go visit you and my student goes and visits you and you're not a certified training center, I expect nothing but you to welcome them with open arms. That's the way it should be. You know what that's called, right? It's called Jiu-Jitsu Nighting. We are, there is all these academies and affiliations and separation, but at the end of the day, it is Jiu-Jitsu against the world and we are united by our love for Jiu-Jitsu. And, uh, and that's the way it should be because there's too many people out in the world, 1% of the world doing jiu-jitsu, less than one-tenth of 1%. It's, that's us against the world in the sense that we have a lot of educating to do. It's us for the world. It's us for the world. So we have to for unite to educate and we, we take our roles very seriously. We couldn't be more honored to be members of this family that has such a positive influence on the world, learning jiu-jitsu. And at the end of the day, it's all about sharing this stuff. And our grandfather at his core was a teacher. So for us, being Gracie family members, more than anything means being in a position to help and to educate other people with the positive impact of jiu-jitsu and anyone else who's a practitioner or a teacher mm -hmm. who, who prioritizes and, and, prime, and prides themselves in helping others learn jiu-jitsu is, is, is fighting for the same cause. This is too amazing, you guys. Like you too said, amazing. at the core, he was a teacher and he fought to prove the effectiveness of the art that he taught. That's it. He believed so much in what he was teaching that he was willing to fight for it. That's it. Now, today, people could ask, well, why aren't you guys fighting? And we're not fighting because we don't need to. We're here to share and give. Now our grandfather said to us, he said, you guys, you can fight MMA if you want. If you get paid really, really well, and you want to work out really well, you want to see if you're the better athlete and test yourself, that's okay. But you don't need to. You should yeah. do it because it's, it's, it's more for you. It's not to prove that jujitsu is good, is the greatest. We already know jujitsu is amazing and jujitsu has done amazing things. And it will keep doing amazing things forever. Don't feel obligated to defend jujitsu's honor. Now, there are many people out there that are fighting to still prove jujitsu. Yeah. And that's amazing. And we love you. And you're proving it. And when you prove it, people want to learn it. And when they want to learn it, they're going to search. And when they search, hopefully we put a school somewhere near them that they can go to. And if not a school, they can go to Gracie University. So everybody's working together. Like Henner said, jujitsu against the world, jujitsu for the world. That's what's up, you guys. Listen, we're moving to the new academy very soon. We're so excited about that. But this is the first time we've done this on this scale. Uh, we appreciate everyone who joined us. Special shout out to Evandro, uh, Jay for being our data slash you know support team here. Mike and Brian for swinging by on their Sunday. We know they have a lot more important things to do. You can tell by just looking over there and seeing how busy they are and how productive they are. So everything is. <laughs> Right now they're just they're posting questions on the feed. But much respect, you guys. We appreciate every one of you. CTCs out there, you guys. If we don't say it enough, let us say it now. We can't be more grateful for the service you guys are providing and for spreading the word of jiu-jitsu. Um, to know that the quality of teaching and techniques and curriculum is getting out to the way it is because of you guys, that's one of the, the most gratifying things in our lives, 100%. And for other students out there who are you know, out there learning through GU, know that Gracie University is not just an extension of us and what we're doing here. Gracie University is us. It has become, we just awarded the first ever 100% pure Gracie University Purple Belt last week to Larry Pinson a couple days ago actually. And this is for us was one of the most rewarding and exciting uh, kind of validations of our, all of our efforts over the last 10 years. We started in 2008. So the world will learn Jiu Jitsu and we won't stop till we drop. And for us, preserving Jiu Jitsu as an art of self-defense, as our grandfather intended it to be pra practiced in a safe, structured manner, is, is what we dedicate our lives to. And uh, we're having fun every step yes. of the way. For us, and you know, there are so many people out there that want this. Yes. There's so many people out there that are on the same path of continuing Andrew Gracie's legacy. And it's only a matter of time before we connect with them and make the, the push even stronger. So 
We'll be connecting soon. That's what's up, you guys. If you like this live stream, make sure you guys share this actual thing. Get it out there. And if this gets enough traction and excitement, we'll do it again. And we don't have to wait till our grandfather's birthday to do it again. Yeah. The truth is we have a garage, we have a Sunday, we have some technology, and we have some friends. And that's all you really need to get down. And the fact that you guys are watching and this is you know something that people liked is, uh, is all we need to know to continue doing these, you guys. So much respect. Get your questions ready because the next live stream won't take as long as this one took. All right? Much respect, peace out, and we'll see you guys on the mat. Thank you.